Everybody. All right, let's get started here. So, just want to say hi and welcome to our event, Students Are the Future, connecting students with climate action and education. This event is a partnership between U.S. Energy um, on the Carbon Summit, Carbon Summit Series event with Boise State Campus Sustainability um, to celebrate Earth Day. And uh, yeah. So before we officially begin, um, I want to point out that restrooms for this space, I believe if you go down the stairs, um, right on the left, we have restrooms over there. Um, I just hope, you know, I invite you to take care of yourself throughout the event. Um, water, coffee, you know, use the bathroom as you need. Um, we'll have a virtual component in this space. So for the Q&A, um, we'll have just this one microphone to work with. So we'll have um, our campus sustainability team be running the mic back and forth when we do that. Uh, my name is Ari Weidemeyer, and I'm a sustainability manager with Boise State Campus Sustainability. Um, I work with Kat Davis, the sustainability director, and the rest of our amazing sustainability um, team. Uh, our mission with Campus Sustainability is to educate, empower, and engage students, faculty, and staff to learn how we can leverage our, um, oh, to engage a community and adopt more sustainable practices and learn how they can leverage their degree, work hobbies, or home to build more sustainable futures. We do everything from events like recycling challenges, data collection and reporting, action planning, and so much more. Can I have the campus sustainability team raise their hands? All right, thank you. <laughs> so I want to take a moment to soak into this space. The events this week have been our first in-person events since our Earth Day um, 2019. We've just done a couple virtual events since then. And so it's been like about three years since we've come together as a community like this. Um, but today is about emphasizing that even though we may not have gathered as a people in the past, you know, the work of climate action still has not paused. So we know that it's a dire, the world's in a dire situation from the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest last summer to unprecedented, wi unprecedented wildfires and hurricanes over the last few years, we feel the urgency of climate change. Not just as a distant threat, but as a day-to-day -day reality. We hear the call of the recent IPCC report loud and clear. 
with all the doom and gloom, we have to come together and celebrate empowering students for climate action. All right. I want to take a moment to thank the people who have supported the creation of this event um, to put together this really awesome space and just everything. It's, it's, been, it's been wonderful having all this help. So I'd like to thank our generous sponsorship from Idaho STEM Action Center, Idaho Business for the Outdoors, and Idaho Power to specifically support this event, as well as these other amazing community partners that have supported the Carbon Summit event series as a whole, including Power Knot, Digester Dock, Boise Metro Chamber, Chateau de Flore, and more. I would like to give a recognition to um, the pre appreciation of the amazing students that have worked timelessly um, to make this event possible. Um, their communication has been received and um, the communication that we've had um, has been great. And yeah. And before we jump in to our first presenter, I just want to go over the agenda really quick. So we will have um, Dr. Jen Pierce discuss youth climate action. We will have the Carbon Venture Challenge student pitches and these are the finalists, so it's the big deal. And we will wrap up today with having um, several student speakers talk about their amazing projects. All right. So, Jen Pierce, Dr. Jen Pierce is a professor at Boise State in the Department of Geosciences, where she has been since 2005. Her research focuses on wildfires, climate change, landscape response, and soils as a solution to climate change. She is committed to improving climate science education and outreach and is the director of Idaho Climate Literacy Education Engagement and Research Group, or iClear. Dr. Pierce grew up in the mountains of Colorado and Wyoming. She received her undergrad degree from the Colorado College, her master's degree from the University of Oregon, and her PhD from University of New Mexico. Dr. Pierce serves on the board of directors for Friends of the Teton River. When she is not working, she enjoys mountain biking, backcountry skiing, playing music, and exploring the outdoors with her family and dogs. Dr. Jen Pierce, you ready? All right. <laughs> and we'll just have a quick Thank you so much, Ari. Here, I'm going to get my, oh, awesome. my prop up here. <laughs> We'll try to get it. Put my computer here. Too. Oh yeah. You want to put it on there? Okay. There we go. All right. Um, thank you so much for coming, and I'm gonna go ahead and get going and start the music. Maybe. All right. While Ari is getting the, um, the music going, um, I just wanted to show you climate, the, my climate scarf, Karen, which I named after Karen, who made the climate scarf. Um, and uh, she is a colleague of mine in the geosciences department. Uh, so we're gonna start with, um, with a little photo montage of that. Right. Thank you for coming. Um, just wanted to give us a little space to think about that. That's one language of climate action, and you'll notice I didn't say anything. So, but I'm sure it was um, powerful, um, at least for me, just seeing those climate stripes. I'd like you to think now about your language of uh, climate solutions. Again, that was uh, The Warmth of the Sun by the Beach Boys. And my name is Jen Pierce. I am a professor in the geoscience department. My language of climate action is first through iClear, the Idaho Climate Literacy Education Engagement and Research Group. Um, so check it out. You can Google Boise State iClear and see what we are up to. We meet on the second Wednesday of every month. Next when, the next time will be the second Wednesday in May, and we're gonna meet at Camel's Back and go for a walk and then have beverages. We normally do kind of formal Zoom meetings, but we're not gonna do that this time. 
my other language of climate action is wildfire and soils research, and there's going to be a couple folks who are going to be talking about uh, that today. So looking forward to that. Another language of climate action is climate education. So I've um, done outreach to now thousands of K through 12 students playing greenhouse gas tag. And that's on um, PBS if you're interested. If you Google PBS greenhouse gas tag, that will come up, science treks, I think. Um, and you'd be surprised. So even second graders for 20, 30 minutes of playing greenhouse gas tag understand the basic premise that greenhouse gases trap heat. I'd like you to take now just a minute at your tables, and if you already know everyone at your table, maybe meet someone new, and just think about what your language of climate action and climate solutions might be. Um, so go ahead and, um, and talk about it. So just take a few moments at your tables and meet who you're sitting next to. Talk about your language of climate action and climate solutions. Um, I'm going to see if I can pick on some of you now. Anyone want to give an example of a, uh, a type of climate action or climate solution maybe that they hadn't thought of or something cool that they learned? Um, I was just going to say we were talking about how we make sure that w ourselves are um, involved in things and like educate ourselves and then we're able to go educate like our family and friends uh, not necessarily children but uh, we just educate ourselves and others around us fantastic thank you so much Mackenzie so any other um, fun things you learned interesting things you're getting put on the spot here <laughs> uh, yeah so um I would say for, for Digester Doc, one of the things that we do is, is public advocacy and outreach. So sponsoring this event is a way that we are trying to encourage uh, environmental impact through the understanding of sciences and, and, and the application of um, beneficial reuse of waste. And what you're doing at the Digester Doc is fantastic. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more about that. Um, maybe uh, one or two more things folks learned from your tables, I'm coming over to the sustainability crew. <laughs> Obviously, you're, you're engaged in it right now. Anything else? Yes. Um, for me, I think, you know, not being a student anymore, it's really about empowering student voices and knowing that they are the change and they will be the change. Um, and so, you know, they're the future. And that's what this is event is all about is highlighting their work and we're about to hear some from some really cool ones um so that's what i try to focus on yes and by organizing amazing events like this clearly um you, that is a talent so thank you guys so much for for that um 
I am plugging uh, Catherine Hayhoe's book, so Saving Us. So if you haven't read that, this gives us some different ideas also for, um, for climate communication. I wanted to acknowledge um, on Earth Day, Eunice Foote. Um, so Eunice is um, just recently coming into her place in history as the first climate scientist to understand and document the warming effects of carbon dioxide on the atmosphere. And she did this in her kitchen with mason jars. So um, she was, um, not recognized for this contribution until recently. She did publish a paper in 1857 entitled Circumstances, uh, Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays um, in the American Journal of Science. So here's to Eunice Foote on Earth Day. Um, this is also a good reminder, the science is not new, right? We have known about how carbon dioxide warms the atmosphere um, since 1857 um, and then more definitively in 1895. So Savante Arrhenius, um, uh, Swedish, also um, wrote a paper on this, on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. He, being from Sweden, um, said, you know, gosh, I, burning coal will warm up our atmosphere and that's going to be great because it's really cold here. Um, so so his, uh, he, he documented this and his takeaway was that this one might be a good thing. So um, this is an animation. I'm not sure if it's gonna run. I just wanted to point it out. If you're ever teaching about climate change, this is the single most effective animation that I've um, used. It's, yeah, I'm not sure if it's gonna run. It's called the pump handle animation. So if you Google pump handle NOAA, this comes up and it shows measured changes in carbon dioxide um, from both modern records and from ice core records over time. So check that out. Also just wanted to remind us of this. So we've been talking a lot about um, regenerative agriculture, which is fantastic. And um, of course, Dave Montgomery came and spoke uh, last night and Gabe Brown, but, um, and fantastic, uh, work that they're doing. They're all of these sectors are up for grabs. So any way that we can reduce CO2 emissions from any of these sectors is a win. Of course, our largest component here is energy, energy use in buildings, transport, energy use in industry. Um, but we do have, you know, things over here like cement production. Um, there's a PhD student in our department who is right now working on naturally precipitated calcium carbonate to strengthen soils. This could be a great alternative to cement. So just a reminder that these are all areas we want to focus on. I'm not really going to go into a lot of my talks, and if you want me to talk about the science of climate change and the geologic history of climate change, I could do that. But um, I think for folks in this room who have made the effort to come here on a Friday, beautiful Friday morning, you already know this. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not going to focus on that. Instead, what I'm going to focus on is um, that there is indeed hope. Okay, and we're going to talk now about these different languages. What I would like everyone to leave with from my talk is that all of us speak, we're all different people. We all have different strengths and we all have different languages that we can use to address climate change, whether this is actually talking about it like I'm doing now or by um, effectively managing our university's grants and donations, um, by um, doing cutting edge, research to understand how our soils are storing carbon by bringing people out to community gardens. These are all ways, these are all different ways of communicating about climate change. On the language of politics, I would remind everyone that the midterms are coming. Uh, this stalled uh, Build Back Better bill that is in Congress is crucial. So here, this shows our, um, let's see if there's a, there we go. This shows the um, estimated um, emissions of CO2 with our current trajectory, trajectory. This shows our emissions if the Build Back Better bill passes. This would meet our 2030 goal. So on a national level, this is key. 
The language of policy, for any folks who are out there who are doing policy, policy is so important and so complicated. Um, so policy changes like um, ha requiring climate analysis and drilling decisions. This is huge, right? Um, so those types of policy decisions will make a big difference. So thanks for the folks who are working on policy. The language of climate justice. Um, so efforts that are underway to increase inclusion, to increase diversity, those efforts essentially also help to address climate justice. There are millions of people on our planet who are being displaced from their homes and who are having, experiencing adverse health, health effects and even dying as a result of climate change. This includes folks, um, most of them people of color, who are living in polluted areas, people who cannot afford air conditioning, migrant workers who are out working in the fields in temperatures over 110 degrees. These are direct effects of climate change on human health and directly relate to climate justice. Like to highlight a few uh, climate maps. So the language of climate maps. This is these are produced by a friend of mine, Jen Marlin, at the Yale Climate Communication Center. This shows the estimated percent of adults who support tax re rebates for people who purchase energy efficient vehicles and solar panels. Eighty two percent. People support this. This is a no brainer. So this should be something we are doing now. Percentage of adults who believe schools should teach about the causes, consequences, and solutions to global warming, 78%. So again, these warm colors on this map mean broad scale agreement. People want this taught in our schools. Percentage of adults who support regulating CO2 as a pollutant, 75%. Um, so if you are out there and thinking, gosh, no one really wants to do anything about climate change, that is not what the data shows. It shows that nationwide this, these, these actions are broadly supported. But we're in Idaho. You might say, oh, not here in Idaho. It's different in Idaho. Is it? No, it's really not. So again, 84% of Idahoans support funding research into renewable energy sources. 80% of Idahoans um, support providing tax rebates for energy efficient vehicles. 71% regulate CO2 as a pollutant. 63% um, set limits on CO2 from existing coal fire power plants. Importantly for what I do, 76% of Idahoans support that schools should be teaching about global warming. This is not being done at the K through 12 level in our schools, despite the fact that the majority of Idahoans support this. This needs to change immediately. The language of renewable energy. Guess how much coal Idaho has? Zero, right? None. Instead, we have all of the renewables. We have hydro, we have solar, we have wind, we have geothermal, we have small scale nuclear. We have all the renewable options. We should be the poster child for a carbon zero state. We could do that tomorrow, not by 2050, by tomorrow. We could start doing this. We don't have any coal in our state. All right, some other languages, the language of the soil. And for those of us who were here last night, we had some great talks about that. And they've got some good experts here in the audience um, on that as well. So if you'd like to learn more about the language of soil, um, come to the Boise State Community Garden tomorrow at 10 and talk to Angela. She's over here and she's going to present here in a little bit. Um, and we've got some other great expertise on soils in, um, in the audience. All right, the language of carbon storage. So talking a little bit about a um, ongoing NSF grant that I have, and I've got some of the student researchers here in the audience, um, Eddie, Schuyler. What we're working on is how we can better store carbon as inorganic carbon. This is, um, some of you might know it as caliche. Some of you might know it as the white stuff in the soil. That's actually another way that we are storing carbon in Idaho's soils. 
and um, we've got some really exciting research going on there. So this ties into the language of sequestration. So what if carbon sequestration actually looks like this? And for some of you in the audience, you're saying, oh boy, I don't want it to look like chemistry. I don't like chemistry. That's okay. That doesn't need to be your language. Um, but if chemistry is your language, I could use your help because I'm a geomorphologist and not a chemist. And we have some really exciting um, ongoing research that is addressing how we can best store carbon, not just as organic carbon, but inorganic carbon in Idaho's soils. Our farmers are already doing this. Let's reward them for these efforts with, um, with carbon credits or tax rebates, which ties into the policy end. Okay, the li language of climate stories. Um, at this point, I'm gonna see if Sarah will actually, will you come up and talk about this? Okay, come on up. So this is a project um, that a senior Boise State student is working on with another student and um, Ben at the high school. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Braille, I'm in Jen's climate capstone class for the climate studies minor and I'm currently working with high schooler Tyson Russell he had this wonderful idea of you know we need to start talking about climate change so why don't we start with sharing stories and he's created this amazing website this is the front page of it um, and so we worked on collecting local Boise climate stories um, I started with working with Boise State professors and Boise State students and asking them to share how climate change has affected them or their favorite places in nature. And so we have a bunch of amazing audio stories and a bunch of amazing written stories from one of Jen's UF100 classes that will be displayed on this website and hopefully be displayed as an interactive screen exhibit with the Boise watershed as we go further. And so as you move through this website, you would click here the stories and hopefully you would be able to listen to all these amazing people talk about their climate stories and how climate has affected them. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. And ask Sarah more about that if you'd like to share your story. Um, we wanted to have this screen up at Boise State, but ran into a lot of roadblocks. Um, for actually installing the screen. And so I would challenge Boise State to overcome some of these barriers and truly become a university of distinction in the area of innovation um, and allow our students to um, put up the materials like this. So instead, it's gonna go to the watershed. Or watershed. We raised money for a $2,000 screen and um, we couldn't get permission to get it up at Boise State. So instead, it's gonna go to the city of Boise. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, the language of climate action plans. We heard some about this last night uh, from Steve. Wonderful work going on at the city of Boise. So if you haven't yet, check out, uh, please check out their climate action plan. So lots of concrete items that the city of Boise is working on. Um, to uh, plug what's going on tomorrow, there's an Earth Day celebration tomorrow at the Boise watershed. And there's going to be a very cool unveiling of a new mission for the Boise watershed. So come check it out. First 200 people get free tacos. I'm bringing my 10-year-old uh, daughter and her entire birthday party there. There's going to be some great demos. So come check out the uh, Boise watershed. Speaking um, of other forms of action, today, right now, in my daughter's schools, they don't have the lights on in their classrooms. Today is the power down day for the Boise schools. We shouldn't have the lights on in this uh, classroom, right? Um, so this would be an easy target for Boise State to try to meet this challenge that the Boise schools is already doing. So on power down day, um, the previous power down day, they saved over um, 11,000 kilowatt hours of energy. This is as much energy as an average home in the US uses for a year. This is from one day of reduction in the Boise schools. I would challenge Boise State to do the same thing next Earth Day. Why don't we have a power down day? Okay. Uh, Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, Jane's students. So these are students who were sponsored to take my UF100 class by Jane Fonda. Uh, she paid for their tuition. And in exchange, she wanted each of them to do um, some action. And boy, they did. So here they are. This was last uh, end of fall semester with my dog, Hunter. In particular, what's happening right now, today, is the language of protest. 
Uh, one of these students, uh, Lizzie, ran for the school district board. Um, Here is another recent uh, article in the Statesman um, where these students are demanding that the Boise schools um, pr actually commit to clean energy. Today at noon, there is a youth climate strike on the Capitol steps. So I'm going to be biking down there with my lunch from here and um, giving them a shout out. And then I'm coming back to hear all of your amazing presentations. So this is a quote from Shiva on, uh, he's one of the main organizers of this event. Uh, Shiva says, I'm sick and tired of our federal, state, and county elected officials in action on this crisis, said Raj Bahandari in a phone interview. I'm sick and tired of waking up every morning with an overwhelming sense that people are dying and there's very little I can do about it. We students deserve to be adequately prepared to face the climate crisis the boomers have created. We deserve a livable future and the opportunity to enjoy the same beautiful and wild Idaho our parents and our grandparents experienced. That's not too much to ask, I don't think, right? Um, this is, uh, and if you're, so if you're feeling angry as well, um, that could be a language. All right, the language of art. Um, I'm looking to see if Mihana is here. So this is happening tomorrow, the Art for Climate Boise. So check that out. You can Google that. Um, at 4 p.m., we have the grand opening of displaying student climate art. And I have to tell you, the pieces that we have received are absolutely outstanding. Here are a couple examples. So this exhibit will go on. Um, through the 30th. So if you can't catch it tomorrow, come and check them out through the 30th. There's going to be speakers, food, music. There's going to be a band. Um, this is right on Americana Boulevard, kind of near the skate park. So 518 Americana Boulevard. So come check it out tomorrow at 4. And I'll be there with the birthday party and all the 10-year-old girls as well. So just look for those small children. Uh, this has been organized by Ben Bingham, who is one of Jane's students, uh, Mihana and Kyle, who are also in my climate capstone class. And here's a couple other examples of this art. So maybe this is your language, right? This is another language of climate, climate change. The language of math. So um, for those of us who are using math and science to quantify and understand rates and processes of climate change, that is super important. And I know from my colleagues and from my own brothers uh, that my, my brother is a salmon biologist. He's also an extreme introvert. For him, doing this would be absolute torture. He doesn't have to. That is not his language. His language is collecting the data we need on salmon populations to make informed decisions. So that is his language. Danielle and her group um, will be using the language of wildfire education tomorrow at the Boise Watershed. So really fun interactive demos. If you are a teacher or know other teachers, um, there's going to be a teacher professional development um, on this topic as well. So hands-on, place-based education. The language of waste audits. Yeah. Um, so we have got a partnership, a new partnership with St. Luke's Hospital. And one of our other students, Doug, has been doing waste audits of the emergency room at St. Luke's. So um, they are going to use that to reduce their waste contributions. In addition, there are a lot of great upcoming talks from St. Luke's. So, and you heard from Dr. Ethan Sims and Stephanie Wicks last night about some of these talks and this action. The medical industry, if it was a country, would be the fifth largest emitter of carbon in, on the planet. The medical industry produces and uses a huge amount of carbon. So anything we can do to reduce that is a huge win. So come to some of these talks, and I'll make sure that these are on the sustainability calendar as well. The language of conservation. So Idaho is really blessed to have intact wilderness, forests, BLM lands. These lands are so important to preserving resilience in our systems to a changing climate. So if you work to protect these lands, if you recreate and talk about the importance of public lands, keep doing it. 
Um, in Idaho, we are, it is truly unusual to be in a position that we have still these pristine waterways and forests and rangelands for our animals. All right, the language of prevention. So I study wildfires, and I'm not going to talk too much about that. Human started wildfires, human started wildfires account for 84% of all wildfires in the U.S. Has tripled the length of the fire season and dominated an area seven times greater than that affected by lightning fires. Here is an aerial view of the Table Rock fire um, that burned back in, I think it was uh, 2016. So really lucky we didn't lose more um, life and property in that event. That was a human caused fire. Low-hanging fruit like, I don't know, maybe not allowing fireworks that are not even illegal to set off in Idaho to be sold in Idaho. Currently, you can buy fireworks that are not illegal to set off in the state, but you can buy them here. Not a great idea, right? So um, these are, I think, again, low-hanging fruit in terms of prevention. Getting back to the language of education, um, here is Olivia. She was another service learning student in the capstone class. And she just did amazing outreach at Washington Elementary. Um, and we went there, of course, with uh, Karen, the, the climate scarf. So there's um, a lot of work. The green team now at Washington is really interested in regenerative agriculture. We asked them to pick their topic, and that is what they would like to work on. They'd like to start a community garden. So would love to connect folks in the audience with the Washington Green Team. All right, this is the, um, the sobering news, though. This is the percentage of adults who discuss global warming at least occasionally. And these were results from 2020. Blue colors show less than 50%, so 35%. Okay. Idaho. Discuss global warming at least occasionally, 36%. Or hear about global warming in the media at least once a week, 27%. This needs to be something we're talking about. And so whichever language you identified at the beginning of this talk, keep talking more frequently and talk louder. So my recommendation here, um, choose your language and then talk about it. I wanted to um, include a couple quotes on this from Rumi. Beyond feelings of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When you're talking uh, about climate change with people, don't be, don't be right. It's not important to be right. What's important is to have the conversation. And to have a conversation means that you're truly listening to the other person. And they may have a really different perspective than you. So have that conversation. Um, and that will allow us as citizens and Americans and global citizens to meet in that field of understanding. Another quote, don't wait for the perfect moment. Take the moment and make it perfect. So look for opportunities to discuss climate change in whatever your language, um, whenever you can. The only difference between an ordinary life and an extraordinary life is that little extra. <laughs> so all of you, by being in this room, have already taken that little extra. So thank you so much for being here. Another one, this one's from Fred Rogers. I really like this quote. Often when you think you're at the end of something, you're at the beginning of something else. For several of you in this room, you're at the end of your high school career, maybe, for Skylar. Um, maybe you're at the end of your college career, for Sarah. Um, but you're at the beginning of something else. I'll end uh, with a quote. Um, oh, and another plug for iClear. So ask me about this. Again, it's the second Wednesday of every month if you're looking to have that conversation. And you can check it out if you Google Boise State iClear, and you'll get my, my name. And you'll get my web page that needs to be updated. So I need some help from someone younger and smarter than me. Uh, this is from Terry Tempest Williams. 
Finding beauty in a broken world is creating beauty in the world we find. For me, we find this beauty through relationships, with people in place, with other species. Integrity is the word that comes to mind. Integrity and presence. And she gave just a wonderful talk for the idea of nature, nature not too long ago. So, um, so with that, I'll close and uh, take any questions. So thank you. Jen. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about wildfires and human-caused wildfires in the West, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the prescri prescribed fire in the West and if you know much about how they might be implementing that to try to mitigate um, human-induced fires. So that is a great question, Angela. Thank you. Um, so so prescribed fire, what, what the, the first thing with prescribed fire is that you have to understand the vegetation type that you're in. So say for example, applying, so the premise of prescribed fire was really developed in ponderosa pine forests, which um, in historic times, so in the Little Ice Age, about um, end of the 1800s, early 1900s, was typified by frequent low intensity fires that burned out the underbrush and small seedlings and then created these open park-like stands. So prescribed fire in Ponderosa pine forest where there's been fire suppression and um, development of that underbrush will work. The problem is that that same premise has been applied to say lodgepole pine forests. Lodgepole pine forests are designed by nature to grow in very dense stands. Lodgepole pine forests are prone to stand replacing fires about every 300 years or so. So trying to thin or do prescribed fire in lodgepole really will not work. Same thing with, of course, our sagebrush step. So sagebrush takes sometimes decades to reestablish, and in that time, cheatgrass will take over. So for our sagebrush step, we really want to limit fire for those pristine areas, we want to try to keep fire out of that ecosystem. Those ecosystems really did not experience a lot of frequent fires pre-humans um, because they weren't as prone to lightning fires because they're typically at lower elevations. So I think the, the first thing is that you really want to talk with the, the land managers and the folks who are really familiar with that landscape and then of course look at the longer record. So my records of fire activity um, in Idaho go back 10,000 years. Um, so that gets beyond the effects of humans and then can really evaluate the effects of those interactions um, among climate, vegetation, geomorphic response, um, and fire frequency. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, sharing all of that. It was, uh, felt like I was in class, <laughs> which is good. Um, can you, can you um, develop the idea around inorganic carbon in soil and how that, is that a, can you do that really quick? And why I'm asking is um, the technology that our company's commercializing around measuring soil carbon measures all carbon in the soil, inorganic and organic, which is different than the conventional approach. Yeah. So if it if you if if it can if it has to be offline, we'll do it after. But it'd be really interesting to hear. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that question, and I'm excited to talk to you more about your work. Um, so Skyler will present a little bit on um, on our work, but the 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 bottom line is that what we went out. Okay, so we went out to Kimberly, Idaho, where they are irrigating for corn. So like a meter of of water a year now. I didn't think we'd find any inorganic carbon because typically in natural dry land ecosystems then that inorganic carbon which is calcium carbonate would get dissolved and then um, that would just get flushed out um, in the water. Instead what we found is there's actually quite a bit of inorganic carbon um, in those irrigated landscapes in Kimberley. So 
what, um, what we're investigating further is the really um, whether the increase in below ground CO2 from increased root respiration, so now those roots, there's all these plants now growing on that landscape respiring CO2, so we've increased our CO2. Um, the irrigation water is from the um, Snake River and actually is, is in a lot of cases quite hard, so it has, it has the calcium that we need for that part and then they're also adding fertilizers which often have um, some, some calcium amendments. amendments. So, um, so both of those would act to drive this, uh, this reaction. What we're interested, and then just last week, Somae gave me her dissertation chapter which showed a correspondence actually between microbially enhanced precipitation of inorganic carbon and organic carbon content in the soil. So I'm, I'm very excited about this, um, and so I'd love to talk to you more. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> carbon is a system, and it's a complicated system. And, uh, but, you know, again, what, um, for, for folks who aren't as um, obsessed with soil carbon as maybe we are, uh, what, what we really want is any, anything that is drawing that CO2 out of the atmosphere and into the soil is a win. And then this could potentially be win-win for our farmers, um, and that would be amazing. So, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Jen, so much for that awesome presentation. Um, I had a question more about um, climate education. Um, so I know there's a lot of things happening in Boise um, with climate education. However, how do you see things moving along for more rural Idaho um, in schools that may not have access to um, the resources that we are building here? That's a really important question, Skylar. And so we, as a university, of course, um, part of our blueprint for success is expanding our outreach to rural areas and really um, engaging students in rural areas with what's going on at Boise State. So this is part of our mission, I would say, anyway. Um, so then the challenge, the first challenge is this. Most uh, K through six students get an hour or less of science a week. So step one is we need to get climate education out of the science box and teach science more in these, get in these classrooms. The reasons for this, um, so K through six teachers have one semester of science preparation, typically, um, for that teacher training. So those teachers, um, what we've, what Danielle's research has found, um, if I can find her slide, is that um, <coughs> teachers lack the both experience and then the confidence to, to teach about some of these science concepts. So this would be something that be wonderful to get Boise State um, students and teachers engaged with is how can we support our teachers. Um, so the best way to do that is if you can actually go to the school, which might mean, you know, of course, traveling to these rural areas. If that's not possible, now we're all used to Zoom, right? So um, can we set up Zoom lessons where we can send those students materials ahead of time? And the best thing we can do is what Chris Taylor calls phenomena-based research. So what this would be is, I'm going to just hand you this book, because it is a tangible item. Um, you actually give the students a small, um, you know, hopefully tangible thing they can hold and look at and be curious about. And then that prompts questions. So we're doing this with, uh, with soils. So we have some soil demos that Alyssa has developed where um, the students can look at infiltration through tilled versus no-till soils. They love that. So if you're doing anything with soils, uh, please um, consider doing some K through 12 outreach because the students love it. And you bring them real soils with real worms, oh, they love that. And you get a microscope and then they can actually look at all the, the fungi, they love that. So there's, um, there's lots of things I think um, we can do. And so the first thing would be just to start to contact those schools. If you have a niece, nephew, whatever, in a rural <laughs> school, contact their teacher. Say, um, I'd 
love to engage. Is there anything I can do? So, yeah, great question. All right. Hi, how are Hi. you? Um, so I'm a rancher in Oregon, and uh, 1,050 acres of my property burned out of the 1,600 oh. last year in two of the fires. And I'm going through the process of replanting and working uh, through the strategy, so on and so forth. But what I'm finding in my research is, is that there's a big disconnect between what the government understands and what they're willing to fund versus what you understand and what me, the rancher, is trying to put back into the earth in a logical way. And I was wondering, for a layman, how could you advise on pushing initiatives forward into the government to say maybe we need to relook at this a little bit and and come at it with a little bit more strategy as opposed to just throwing mud against the wall and seeing what sticks wow uh, thank you for for sharing that and that's I'm I'm really sorry about the the fire um, couple things so folks like Ben I'm gonna point at Ben right here so wave uh, so, so Ben and the, the policy folks and Jared Talley in particular who's a professor in, professor in environmental studies would be someone I'd like to connect you with um, so Jared is also a third or fourth generation rancher um, and so he is familiar with the really frustrating obstacles from from the government so modifying things like um, you know the on and off days for your grazing um, and those should be something that you as the land manager would have more um, say over depending on whether it's a wet or dry year right then you could make sure um, so and I don't know if you have um, uh, if you have cattle or not but um, so I guess to, to press just a little bit further so what are the are there specific regulations where you're like this just doesn't make sense well, I mean, I would say 800 of the, 800 of, of the acres were forest land. Okay. So I'm, I got national forest on three sides of me. So this prescribed burns, there's, it has a knock-on effect to guys like myself, right? Yeah. And I'm going through the process of replanting and, you know, in theory, right, for every tree that burned, a tree must be planted, right? That's the law. But it's not necessarily the most strategic thing to do if the soil is not conducive so in fact what I'm coming up against is is that I'm throwing good money at a bad p situation meaning the soil not yeah you know everybody wants to have trees but just sticking one in the ground and not having any irrigation to it or ha not being the right soil composition to be able to drive success yeah, we planted a tree, but this degree of survival is less than 5%. Yeah. Um, that's really helpful. I was asked to apply for the BLM's advisory panel a couple months ago. I'll check, and, and so if that got approved, um, that I would love to bring this particular um, case to the advisory panel and see if we can um, figure out some, some ways to work with you to get a win-win solution, because um, yeah, that's um, just planting a tree knowing that it's going to die um, is really, first of all, not helpful. Also, um, as we just all learned, the climate conditions have changed and it, um, those low, lower elevations may not be conducive to trees anymore anyway and I need to come out and, and look at them. So um, I'll get you my, con I'd love to get your contact info. So yeah, thank you. Um, we just have a question from a virtual viewer. They'd like to know where you got the Idaho polling data from and if it includes outside of Ada County. The Idaho polling data from the Yale maps? Um, yes, great question. So if you go to um, Yale Climate Communications, um, that shows you uh, where that data is from. Let's go back. I think it's back here. And it shows you actually the on the county basis. So um, these, were, um, these were national surveys and then they broke them out by states and by counties. So there is data for all of the counties in Idaho. Um, so if that viewer goes back to this slide, you can see 
the actual county specific data for Idaho. Uh, yeah, Yale climate communications maps. So, yeah. All right, that is all the time we have for questions today. Um, let's give one more round of applause for Dr. Jen Pierce. All right, thank you so much, um, Jen, that was, that was awesome. So next, we are gonna move into our Carbon Venture Challenge pitches, and I want to introduce Jason Marmon. He is the director of, let's see. Do, do, do. Okay, he is the director of US Energy and has been our community partner for all of our Carbon Series events. We had a great event yesterday with over 100 people where we had people like Gabe Brown and Dr. Montgomery talk about soil science. And yeah, it was great. So Jason, you wanna take it away? Thank you very much, Ari. Thank you for the sta campus sustainability. And thank you all for being here. Um, we had an idea of how to engage the students around sustainability and we're like, well, how do we do this the best way that we can? So we partnered with Boise State Venture College and we came up with the Carbon Venture Challenge, which basically looks at the sustainability index score of, of Boise State and we try to raise that. And so we found a, a couple partners to help us do that. And we, have, uh, we had a great engagement or, or, or great student involvement. And so that's what we wanna showcase today. So this is our actionable sustainability. It's like, where can we actually take action on? And so, Jan, thank you so much for setting the stage for the Carbon Venture Challenge. And I'd like to introduce the guy who really took the lead on this and, and made it so simple that we think that's the key to sustainability is actually simplicity. And so I'd like to introduce you guys to Ryan Vasso, director at uh, the Venture College. And just a huge round of applause for this guy. You, I mean, crushed it. Thank you. Uh, just a tiny bit of background about the Venture College. So uh, we are a program in Boise State to help students launch businesses outside the classroom. It's literally, literally our sole focus. We don't give grades. There's no homework. There's no assignments. It just We literally tell students, go out and build a business and, and we'll help you. Uh, traditionally, we have an eight-week program. Uh, it's called our incubator program where students will come in with existing ideas and we put it to the test and try to see how fast uh, they can do their customer discovery, prototyping. Some even get to the, to the actual revenue and sales amount um, but what we found is as students a lot of times you know wh while they want to be entrepreneurs they don't necessarily have burning ideas right now or clear solutions right now and that's why the venture college also does competitions like this we call these reverse pitches essentially we partner with in this case the university but in other uh, competitions we've done uh, stakeholders in the home building industry in cybersecurity, and we've done other industries as well Essentially, they come to us and say, here's our problems. Like, here's, here's what we're dealing with, here's our problems. And we give students uh, usually about one week to hear the problems for the first time and to do as much customer discovery as possible and get to a prototype stage as fast as they can. So the three out of the four students you'll see today uh, had no, we're not working on any type of sustainability issues at all before a week ago. Uh, I think you'll all be impressed on how much progress they've made, both in customer discovery and actual easy solutions. What we find, kind of Jason alluded to it, and I'm a firm believer on this, sometimes entrepreneurship can be really hard if you're trying to you know, recreate the wheel, uh, but a lot of times these are gonna be, you're gonna hear opportunities where you know, if Boise State just changes one little thing, or if, if there's a new opportunity, like it seems like really low, easy hanging fruit. And that's really what this competition was about. Uh, we had. Uh, 20 teams to start out, eight made it to like the preliminary pitch round. Uh, these four we think are truly like could be implemented tomorrow um, or at least can, can start showing progress tomorrow. So uh, with that, I think uh, I'll pass it back to Jason real quick. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate on elaborating on that. And so let's, um, if, if the judges don't mind, do you guys want to just introduce yourself and say who are you with? You guys, okay, Jason, take us away. Good morning, I'm Jason Bradley, I'm president of Carbon Asset Solutions, um, North American headquarters in Olds, Alberta, Canada. So I came down for the last two days upon an invite in to participate and um, yeah, I'll make it brief. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Prince McClinton, uh, President Art of Visuals. We're based here out of Boise, Idaho, and happy to be here today. Hi, my name is Jess Furman. I'm the Executive Director of Idaho Women in Technology and the founder, and I'm also a consultant in the venture capital world, so thank you. Hi, Will Reynolds. I am the Environmental Compliance and Sustainability Manager here at Boise State. I'm Barbara Beagles. I'm the Director of Facilities for Boise State. Well, thank you all for being here. We got a rock star panel. We got some students ready to go. I think so. We're going to allow the students to come up and introduce themselves, part of their pitch. They're ready to go? Okay, we're going to rock and roll. Okay, here we go. Good luck. Hello, I'm Hyuna Cho. Oh, it's okay. My name is Savan Desai. Hi. <laughs> Hello, and we are Compass Lisa. And we are here to fuel Boise State's sustainability. And before jumping into our presentation, we would like to thank you all for being here. It's, it's said that one man's trash is another man's treasure. And at Boise State, we're throwing away a lot of treasure. We're wasting food waste. And that affects our sustainability score in two ways, in waste diversion and landscape management. Our initial goal was to have a campus-wide composting program where students can divert their own trash. However, after testing out a bit at the Student Union Building, we quickly realized that students could use a little bit of more education on composting. However, that does not mean that there is no potential in student-led composting, but since the goal of the project was to implement the program as soon as possible, we pivoted to partnering with businesses on campus. There are three local on-campus vendors at Boise, coffee shops at Boise State. There's Guru Donuts, Poppy Seed Cafe, and Urban Fox. Um, and coffee shops produce a lot of used coffee grounds. Um, and by working with them, we, we ensure that we have a sustainable supply of coffee grounds to use as fertilizer. And coffee grounds are great for composting. By creating a public-private partnership, we are able to increase Boise State's STARS rating by three points. And we are able to increase Boise State's on-campus sustainability participation as well. Not only that, because composting what was initially in the trash is such a simple and low-maintenance idea, we are able to implement it in other schools as well. For example, we reached out to Sawtooth Middle School in Meridian and talked to the vice principal about implementing it in their school as well. So far, we contacted all on-campus coffee shops with Urban Fox allowing us to start right away and Guru Duma starting with us next semester. And we are partnering with Boise State Landscape Team to, for them to use the compost in the Boise State on campus. And we also partnered with Boise State Sustainability slash Gardening Club, and they are going to use a partial bit of compost in their garden beds, and will be providing a pickup location for the broader Boise community. Um, by partnering with that one coffee shop, Urban Fox, we can collect seven and a half gallons of used coffee grounds every week, and we can benefit three groups with that. First, the the landscaping department can take the majority of the nitrogen-rich fertilizer. Second, the garden club can use it in their um, already existing garden beds. Third, any um, coffee grounds that can't be put back into the Boise State on-campus ecosystem can be distributed to the broader Boise community by allowing um, residents and citizens to pick up coffee grounds from the community garden and putting it back into their own gardens. And our next steps to grow this um, program is to continue working with groundskeeping to start implementing the organic fertilizer back into the grounds and um, increase the number of food vendors we work with on campus to divert even more waste and since um, taking food scraps and putting them into a compost bin is such a simple and easy low maintenance idea this um, can be taken to other universities um, and other K through 12 schools to put to put uh, that program in place. And we've already started by talking with my alma mater, Sawtooth Middle School, about this. Composting coffee ground is such a simple 
feasible and an impactful way to fuel Boise State sustainability practices. We were Composita, and thank you so much for being here and for your time. grounds getting from the three um, locations on campus to let's say the compost yard within landscape services so uh, first uh, as a test we put we gave um, urban Fox a tin of to, to put their coffee grounds in then after after the for the past three days we've been coming and picking it up and for now we're just taking it home because that was just a test to see if they would do it and now uh, we'll have to continue to talk with landscaping about perhaps supplementing their already existing compost bin of grass clippings and tree branches with those coffee grounds so it's more of a we'll, we'll, we'll continue to talk about how to successfully um, implement it to their ecosystem thanks uh, like your idea um, question is how do you measure the change in carbon so that you, you can identify that it's not getting to atmosphere but it's getting into the soil how are you going to do that hi so we uh, looked at the stars rating system and how they rate the carbon system and we measured that three points would be increased so with when, so at, through research, we found that the it's good to divert waste from the land from from the landfill to composting because it goes back into the ground instead of methane going up. So it, so definitely we would have to do more research about the exact numbers, but we know that it's helpful. <laughs> Mine's more of a comment, but perhaps you can elaborate for me. Um, Devon, right? I think it's really creative that you went to your middle school where you went and you asked them to help you with this. First of all, that's super cool. Grassroots organizations, that's how they get their start is using their network. Um, do you plan to continue picking up coffee grounds and what's your strategy for getting more volunteers to help you with that task so that you're not doing that daily? Because I could see that being an issue. So. Uh, right now, uh, Kiana is the financial officer of the Garden Club, so she'll be taking the lead in making sure that it, the, at least the coffee grounds portion of this will live on. Um, I'm working with my um, with Sawtooth Middle School right now about starting a compost club, which I will, which you know, as the start, I'll be running, and hopefully, as more students take up the composting program, they'll be able it'll be able to live on after I've passed. And the reason uh, the f uh, for the composting program at Sawtooth, obviously students don't drink coffee, but um, with how it's set up, uh, with the hot lunch program, students have to are required to take fruit and milk. And, and, if, and when kids are required to eat something, they're not gonna eat it. They end up throwing it away. They'll take a bite and toss it. So right now the comp, our, the initial idea is to put um, a, ga a, f a large bin and stu labeled with instructions on what you can put and what you can't. And we'll just be right now, ta we'll, we'll ta that our test will start hopefully next week. And then if it's successful, then we'll start working with community gardens and perhaps in fundraising to get more a more official composting bin. So that's the current program for Sawtooth. Is there a reason Starbucks was not on your list of companies? Um, so we, uh, we, were, we were focused on, since this was a week sprint, this was, a, it's a lot faster to work with a local business than try to find who the manager of Starbucks is and who to talk to and perhaps they need to get corporate permission. So with Urban Fox, we emailed the business owner and she said yes, and that was a start. And obviously, well, as this progresses, we can talk to Starbucks about this. They're just slower. <laughs> so we went with local businesses first. All right, we've got time for one more question, question from our judges.
Just wondering if there were any significant questions from your perspective raised by the landscaping um, crew or anybody else that was involved outside of yourselves that you thought was important or moved you in a different direction? So when I contacted landscape team, all they asked me, they said, we would love to use the compost on campus. And they, the question they had was, are you, what would the schedule look like if this is going to be actually implemented? And what's the amount of the compost that's going to be produced? And that was the only question they had about the composting. All right, can we get one round of applause for that first presentation? <laughs> All right, I'd like to welcome Sun Valley Solar Solutions um, and Brandon Yamba. Can you guys all hear me all right? Oh, like, okay, okay. So, hello, my name is Brandon Yagla, and I'm the owner of Sun Valley Solar Solutions. I'm here to show how, some, how my company can solve a big problem facing the industry through my product, the Solwell. My interest in solar and electricity extends back, you know, several years. I've taken several classes on the subject and courses on the design and installation of PV systems. But one thing I noticed throughout the whole process of learning more was one of the big problems with solar is that the panels take up a large amount of space. And in densely populated urban areas, that space is obviously in short supply. So in these areas, farmers and gardeners have also come across a similar problem but they've turned to vertical farming uh, as a way to maximize their production for given a small amount of space. So taking those lessons learned from uh, vertical farming and applying them to solar farming, I've developed a three-dimensional ground-based solar power plant that takes up as much as 70% less surface area than the traditional design, the traditional 2D design. Uh, by having it in a three-dimensional chamber, all the normal solar panels, they have efficiencies about 20 to 25 percent, but given the three-dimensional structure, all the light that enters into the chamber cannot actually escape and be reflected off, so it'll either get turned into electricity or turned into heat and can be re recaptured that way. Um, progress to date, I had the original idea back in uh, the simpler pre-pandemic days of 2018, uh, taking several classes going forward to kind of fill in the gaps of knowledge that I didn't, that I lacked. And fast forward four years and I have a fully functional prototype, as you guys just saw, and I filed for the provisional patent and have a year to file for the non-provisional patent. I would like to partner with BSU to help secure the full IP uh, with, the non, with the full non-provisional patent. And I would also like to incorporate uh, into the next prototype and the next design some more materials to increase the energy capture unlocking more of the ultraviolet light and energy and also like I said reducing the power losses from uh, from heat loss um, and yeah thank you Okay, so are you the team, or is there more than you to the team? Okay, where are you short then? Like, where do you need help? As Ryan has kind of joked, I'm, I'm the science guy on this. I don't know much about the, the business and the marketing aspect, so that's where I have to grow personally a lot. Um, so I would like a lot of help on that front. Um, but then additionally, the legal front of you know, filing for a patent process and mostly just the financials uh, is really the biggest hang up for me and uh, you know, kind of the biggest obstacle so far. Follow up question, and just repeat it for me after I ask. Follow up question is how are you gonna find that help? Uh, so his question was how am I gonna find that help? Um, as now that I've fin uh, filed for the provisional patent, I'm much more confident in being able to disclose you know, 
the finer details of it. And I'd be actively looking to expand the team, either just from you know online marketing through the contacts that I've made through this competition and other previous uh, you know ventures and stuff. Um, just the connections that I've made there have really kind of opened my eyes and opened a lot of avenues to people that are not only able to help but also seem very interested and want to help. Can you go back to the slide that shows your prototype? Not that far. Okay, so I'm having a hard time visualizing like an application. So we have solar panels on this building. Um, how, how would you redesign those solar panels in this type of application in order to capitalize on more power? Yeah, so my, where I envision this is most beneficial is in homes and uh, areas where they don't have enough, like in apartment buildings, where there's a lot more residential units than the actual surface area of your building can provide power for. So using this, you can, just by being able to save up so much space, you can add a lot more panels into that given area, or you need less space of solar panels to power a, a normal house. Um, and so a big aspect of this is that because the panels are not having to be directly exposed to the sun via that lens assembly uh, and the mirrors, uh, the whole structure could actually be placed mm -hmm. underground as long as the light was able to get into that lens and then disperse, you'd be able to get the same, the same power production. So in this picture on the right, can you, can you describe what we're looking at? In the picture on the right, like the, what's the, the cent thing in the center of the table and then So this is the actual solar panels, um, and they're arranged in a three, you know, obviously a geometric shape so that their normal surface area would be about nine, a little over nine square feet, 9.7 I believe is how the math shaped out. But the actual surface area that this structure takes up is just under three square feet. Um, so once this is the, this is the lid essentially to the, the thing, um, and this is just the mirror assembly, and as light hits the mirrors and gets redirected into the lens, the light then enters into the chamber and can scatter around. And there's a lot, there's more, like I said, with the final, the, the next design, I, I'm planning on adding more things to you know, increase the energy capture. But uh, the uh, essential premise is that as the light bounces around in here because it can't escape anymore, the 25% efficiencies that solar panels typically have is no longer really relevant because the light can't escape and can, it just has to be contained inside the structure. Your solar panels are not, your solar panels are virtually covered then. Yeah. Okay, so what, we, what you would see on a roof structure then would be this series of mirrors and then this reflective thing that channels the energy down into this chamber. Yeah, so with this it's more um, for your, your typical like residential pitched roofs, um, other than putting this inside of your attic and having the uh, mirror assembly outside on the roof. This is more, like I said, it's a ground-based solar power plant. So for people that either don't, either have flat roofs for like apartment buildings, or for people that uh, don't have, they don't want to use their roof in, you know, say in urban or resident, uh, residential and rural areas. If they don't want to have to use their roof, they can, they have the option now to also use a much less space in their, on the ground and get the same power output. So it just adds an extra option of, you know, modular, modular ability and uh, kind of gives the power to the, the homeowner of what they want for their design. I think we all have so many questions. Yeah. I think everyone in this room probably has a lot. <coughs> so I've heard a lot of pitches. Great job, by the way. Is this the first time you've pitched? Uh, this particular one, yes, yeah. The, you're doing a great job. Yes. So you asked how you can find resources. I think you'll find some at this table. So I'm happy to help you. Um, so first of all, um, next time I would love it if you could bring a prototype so that we could see it. That would really improve the pitch, I think. Um, my question, and I don't know a ton about solar panels, but I'm wondering, you talked about the um, energy capture being 25% efficiency. How does that compare to a traditional flat panel? That's my first question. Uh, yeah, so the normal pan, the, this, 
doesn't increase the efficiencies of the panels themselves. So the industry standard standard at this point is about 20 to 25 percent efficiencies. Um, so this doesn't increase the efficiency of the panels. Um, so you still have that same rated output. This is again, it's just saving on that space and condensing those panels into a smaller area. And since they have, so not to get too technical and sciencey on it, but with the standard test conditions of 1,000 watts per square meter, they could each panel, the best panels at 25%, can only get 250 watts out of that. By reducing the space that it needs, you're, you're able to get the same power output by having much less space, whereas you would normally need a big field of panels to get the same power. Now you could just need two or three of these little nodes that would be able to produce the same amount. If that answers your question. Okay. So what about the, the size though of the, the smaller panels, right? Where you have to attach the device, or what's the size of the panels? Yeah. Like, what's the size of the panels that are attached to the panels? So what kind of space is that to the panels? Is that part of your equation or your efficiency, or is that just the individual smaller unit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the, the lens assembly and the mirrors. It's a, it's, the benefit of that is that it's a low cost way to increase the amount of power that you're concentrating into the device. Um, so instead of needing to add five or 10 more solar panels, you can add just a bit more surface area of reflective material and you're able to get that power into the chamber to get that increased, uh, you know, that increased capture. Uh, and as far as the size of it goes, again, because uh, what, what I'm approaching with it now is just using a one-to-one -one ratio of if the panels need, you know, 10 square feet of sunlight to be hitting them, then I'm going to condense that same 10 square feet using the, the lens, building it up into a vertical structure and condensing that down into the chamber so that you don't actually need the 10 square feet in a two-dimensional sense. You have that same surface area just built up and taking up less space. Just want to make a quick announcement. Um, we got some microphones in the back, so the judges do actually don't need the mics as long as they speak up. So you're like you're good. Last question, though. Thank you. Two part question: uh, How does the design do in weather? And then B: Is there any fire hazard or any other hazard with the refraction of the light at the various like sun angles? Is it always beaming inward, or is there a chance that it might scatter that? Somewhere else. Yeah, no, that's, a, uh, that's actually a really great question, um, and it's been one of the biggest design hurdles for me. Is because as the sun, you know, rises in the east, sets in the west, and throughout the year it changes in its ele elevation. Um, all of the mirrors are. This is just a rough prototype on the on the mirror assembly, but all of the mirrors would be directly correlated to an angle where the sun is going to be at any given point throughout the year, and angled so that that light is always being directed towards the lens. Uh, as the sun changes throughout the year and everything, the and it's been that's where the biggest the hurdle has been is trying to make it so that when the sun is at you know say it's in the, in the middle of summer and it's beaming all of the energy at the correct angle in the winter it might have a different angle. If it's scattering out, it's going to get just get dispersed. So there's no real fire hazard there of like you know you know shining a magnifying lens on an ant hill or whatever. Um, but also, like, there's no real fire hazard for the device itself because not with included in this, but one of the additional uh, design aspects is that it'll be filled with a fluorescent solution um, to help unlock that ultraviolet light, but then that water would be able to act as a heat absorber, and if anything did catch fire or leak, it would act as its own fire retardant system because it would just flood itself and put whatever out was out. So, wait. Are you also capturing thermal energy with this as well? Yes. Uh, and uh, again, trying to convey, there's several different aspects to this, um, and trying to convey it all in this quick little three minute thing has been one of big challenge. But because as solar panels produce electricity, they produce heat due to resistance, normally that heat is lost to the environment just by air pulling it away and getting it lost. With this, again, with that fluorescent solution, that heat would then be transferred into the fluid and then can be plumbed to either a heat exchanger and sent to your hot water tank, or it can be put through uh, what are called thermoelectric generators and turned that heat directly back into electricity. So there's a lot, again, because of the design, it unlocks just 
limitless possibilities of how we can interact and manipulate that light when we're not stuck with a just two-dimensional approach. All right, can we get one more round of applause? All right, thank you, Brandon. All right, so up next we have Team Efficiency with Morgan Kennedy. Hi, everyone. My name is Morgan Kennedy. Um, happy Earth Day. <laughs> um, these are the wrong slides. Okay. So I'm here to present on how to improve efficiency at Boise State. So the windows in older buildings on campus are not properly insulated, therefore a lot of heat is getting through the windows. This causes the HVAC units to run very inefficient because they're running 24 seven instead of like off and on. They have to run all the time in order to keep the heat out of the building. So this increases energy costs on campus because the systems are overrun, um, inefficiency in the heating and cooling systems. And then there's also uncomfortable temperatures in the room because a lot of heat is getting in through the windows. And then there's also glare from the sun. So the picture in the bottom corner is at my work in the civil engineering building. And one of my coworkers, we get a lot of sun in the morning. So we just put an Albertsons bag on the window to help with that. <laughs> um, so a solution that a lot of people are doing is putting up window film. Window film essentially reflects the heat from the sun off of the building, and then it also reflects UV light, but it also keeps natural light in the building because it can pass through the film. So the benefits of window film include an increase in efficiency because the units aren't overrun. Um, you can also have 29% of HVAC savings because they're running more efficiently, um, UV protection, and then glare reduction. So in this study here, there's two pieces of glass. One piece of glass has film on it, and the other piece does not. The study started at 17 degrees Celsius. The piece of glass with no film rose to thir rose 13 degrees, and then the piece with the film rose only 1.3 degrees Celsius. So why isn't this everywhere on campus? Um, the main reason is the cost. It can cost anywhere between nine to $24 per square foot of the insulation or the film. So one 36 inch by 60 inch window is anywhere between 135 to $360. Uh, this is cheaper than replacing the whole window, but it's still a huge upfront cost. So my solution is film slate. We would go out and find businesses to sponsor the cost of the window in exchange of putting their logo on the window or some sort of call out to them on campus, like maybe a poster with their name on it or a social media shout out to them. So my progress so far, I've reached out to a couple of businesses. Um, these slides are not current. Um, Meridian Window Tint wants to sponsor it. Um, the Knitting Factory, and then Rise and Grind was interested in purchasing some windows to put their name on campus. So, so far with campus approval, I've been reaching out to Brian Entman. He's the director of energy on campus, and he loves the idea of putting film up to help reduce the amount of heat getting through the building, and he was willing to help me do that. So the next steps is to continue like the clearing process on campus, make sure I can put the company's logos on the window or some sort of shout out to them. Um, and then I need to fill out a few forms to get it approved on campus and then find more sponsors. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Have, you. have you ran the math on like the break even point? Um, I've researched it. So like there's a study on like one room and the rate of return, like are you talking about the initial cost and how much you would save? Yeah. Times however many buildings over how much like just kind of like solar, how many months is it gonna take for oh, it's, savings to break even Okay. It's roughly between two to six years. That's what I've been seeing online. But if your building operating costs are thirty thousand dollars and then you have the 29% savings on that, you'd save $9,000 each year on it. So it would pay back 
decently quick, and then if you have sponsors purchasing the initial cost, you'd actually be saving a lot of money from it. Go ahead. Uh, do you have any idea of how long the film lasts? Because I know that is one of the issues where over time they start to bubble, and they look bad, and then it needs to be removed and then replaced. So if it's installed internally, it's roughly 20 years for the lifespan. Externally, it's 15 because you obviously have like the weather and the rain on it, but usually it's around 20. So if you have a four year rate of return, you have an additional 16 years of making money back from the product. What about, have you, have you calculated what the, what the GHD reduction is on this? I don't know what GHD redu reduction is. Okay, so how much, how much reduced carbon emissions will there be from, you know, not spending the energy in cool buildings when they're overheating, et cetera? Like that, that's, a, that's an important number to understand. I have not run the calculations on it, but what I can tell you is what I've seen from my research is it increases the efficiency of the equipment by 25%. So therefore they don't, have like the HVAC systems don't have to run all the time because the building is more insulated. So it's more of like a closed system instead of getting a lot of heat through the window. That's a good start to your answer, but I'm thinking my colleague, the director of facilities and the director of energy would like to know how many tons of CO2E mm -hmm. are not being emitted because that actually would help the organization achieve some of their net zero or their ESG goals as an organization. So be some It'd be a really good thing to have in your pitch. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll look into that more. I wasn't really sure. <laughs> we could figure that out pretty fast. I mean, if we knew if we knew what the reduction was, looking at your energy use reduction before the product was applied versus after the product was applied, then we could probably figure that out. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But anybody that's might might be buying your product or investing, yes. that would be it helpful would, to know yeah. right up in front, right? right, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. I agree. Yeah. And I think it would be easier to figure that out with a group of people. <laughs> okay, so follow-up question, who's your group of people? Who's your team? Me, so far. Okay. <laughs> but I have, I guess I have more people in my group because I have people willing to sponsor my idea, like buying the films and the installation for it. So it sounded like you had someone on campus that was interested already with the, the window film. Were they also, open to the idea of like these various business logos kind of being plastered all over the buildings? I yeah. still haven't, yeah, I still haven't gotten that approved because it's hard to reach out to people and get a response within a couple of days. But I think if they can't have their logo on the window, there should be something where we could put up a poster as like a shout out for the businesses who donated. And then I was also thinking using local film companies to put it up on campus, so we're supporting local businesses. I might be showing my lack of understanding, but is there an offset from the added energy required during colder months? So the window film that we'd be using is low emissivity, so actually in the winter months it helps bring the heat in from the outside, and then in the summer it reflects the sun. But there is ones that are just solar that reflects it, but I think in Idaho we'd need the other ones, the low emissivity ones, because it does both. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, you have one? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a sustainability center in the sub, and there's some screens there. Um, and so that might be an option to portray the sponsor's logos on that. That's a great um, idea. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so just so you know, that, that might be an option. There's options with that. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Sorry about the slides. All right, so I also want to encourage, um, we're going to have lunch after this uh, last pitch, so I want to encourage people to connect uh, with the students since we can have audience Q&A, so yeah. All right, I'll introduce uh, Solar Power Workshop uh, with Benjamin Thomas. All right, here you go. All right, hello everyone. I'm Benjamin Thomasek. Here to talk about uh, 
the solar powered workshop. So in looking at ways to improve sustainability on campus, um, a few areas that I was looking at were the courses that were offered, uh, the energy usage on campus, and particularly solar energy, how it's being produced on campus. And so when looking into these three areas, um, what came to my mind was this, a solar powered phone charger. So uh, this was something that um, I, I was previously a student at DePaul University and I took a course uh, in honors lab science uh, looking at solar panels and we built these. Uh, and it was probably one of the most fun I've had in a class. I remember it very fondly, and I still use this solar power charger to this day. But one problem, though, that this was an honors course that was only offered to a limited number of students. And so when looking at that, or thinking about that, I thought we should offer a workshop on campus. So this would be a multi-day workshop uh, hosted by the Maker's Lab. Um, students would get an opportunity to build their own solar power phone charger. And then this would also give a great opportunity for students to learn more about solar energy and campus sustainability. So some of the benefits of this, uh, in the short term, uh, st students get involved, get excited, have fun building these, uh, learn about sustainability, um, help educate them. Um, in the medium term though, if they actually get to, e when they get to use these, uh, we can improve the energy score on campus by students using less energy on campus to charge their phones and produce their own solar. Um, we can also facilitate peer-to-peer uh, -peer outreach, uh, which can help with our campus engagement in this area. Um, but in the long term, we're hoping to get uh, students, you know, generate some interest in sustainability and help promote uh, advocacy uh, and organize around sustainability. Uh, so to fund this, uh, these solar kits cost about 80 or thir 38 to 40 dollars per kit. Um, right now, the Maker's Lab is expressed interest in um, proposing a budget to try to get some of these kits. Uh, but at the very least, uh, I would like to use some of the prize money from this challenge to buy about 80 solar kits. So. So far, I've talked to a bunch of people on campus, some faculty and some staff. Uh, Ari, uh, Dr. Todd, and Dr. Don have been a really great help in terms of helping validate this idea and helping uh, introduce me to some ideas to help refine it. I've also talked to roughly about 20 or so students who are interested in actually building their own solar power charger. Uh, but more importantly, I have some interested stakeholders. Uh, Dr. Todd Welch, who teaches the uh, Engineering 100 lab, has expressed interest in including this as a part, a module within his course. And that's a course that teaches uh, students from all different disciplines, about 300, I think he said, for next year. Uh, and also, uh, Yitzi Paul, who's kind of the head of the Makers Lab, um, is fully supportive of this idea. He is interested in offering some space, indoor and outdoor, uh, equipment, soldering irons, 3D printers, his staff to provide instruction and help people work through these kits, and also some, some of his staff to help advertise and get the, uh, the word out there to students on campus. Uh, we just need funding. So uh, next steps, uh, I can reach out to some clubs on campus, the Solar Club, uh, there's an electrical club on campus to try to get them involved with this project. Uh, I could, I'm thinking of speaking to some other professors to see if they could add this to their course. Um, also, but at the end of the day, I just need to buy these kits and work with my stakeholders to try to get this workshop off the ground. Uh, as an added bonus, there, uh, an idea has been floated out there to uh, use this also as a summer camp, which can be monetized. Um, and that's about it. Any questions? So for
first of all, I love this idea. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for innovative ways to connect women in STEM to hands-on activities. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see, first of all, I would love this activity at, I'm putting on an event this summer called Fem STEM. We're okay. taking over Ann Morrison Park. We're doing pop-ups throughout the park. I know I can get funding to buy kids. Is this something that you can do in a park, or does that have to be on campus with the equipment? Like, is it portable? If you can get an extension for it, yes. All right, let's do it. Because uh, okay. really, all you need is a soldering iron and some experience with soldering to get the circuit board in this little blue box. Uh, but the rest of it is pretty straightforward. Uh, maybe a 3D printer if you want to get a nice box to put the case in, but it will work without the case. This is just a more of an aesthetic thing question but can anybody build this or do they have to be are there qualifications in order for you to feel comfortable setting someone in front of these tools or would they need like one-on-one -on -one instruction the entire time like how many how many women could you teach to make these at once and how would you do that so that comes down to their comfort level with soldering um, I know at the makers lab they mentioned that they have little courses to help pe get people who don't have soldering experience caught up to speed so that they can do this um, so it really I think it really comes down to the, the soldering is the key component with building these. Um, appropriate for like a one day type of an activity. It would be something that would require more of a longer course or yeah, and, and actually building this myself, it took me a couple a little bit of trial and error because I hadn't soldered in a long time. Uh, I had to go back to the maker's lab at DePaul a couple times to get it right it wasn't working the first couple times and I was a little disappointing. <laughs> have you put together like a step-by-step -step how to do it? Like do we have, a, do you have an instruction sheet that? Yes, I think, it, I think the kit comes with one. Um, if not, there's some online resources that have that kind of step-by-step -step on how to build it and where to put the LEDs in the circuit board and where to put the different resistors and uh, et cetera. Awesome, yeah. Thank you. Do you have any information about like how much energy it takes to actually charge your phone versus obviously using the sun to charge your phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have that all of that data off the top of my head. I do know, so this so solar panel is I think a two watt solar panel and I think the battery pack that's in this little case uh, is about the same kind of storage as most phones are. It's a lithium ion bi battery. Um, so I've, I've found just using it in my own experience that if I just kind of set it by the window, let it charge all day, it'll have enough energy to at least get my phone up to you know, whatever usage during the day, back up to 100, so. And do you have data, like how long does it, I mean, how long does it take to charge your phone fully using the solar device versus just plugging into the wall and charging it? It depends on the charge in the battery. I think it's a little slower than the wall, but if you're doing it overnight, it's usually not a big problem, in my experience. Do you think your, sol your solution is sustainable long term? Like, do you think students would stop wall charging their phone and integrate ongoing solar based cellular charging? I hope so. Um, so, uh, par part of the reason why I'm reaching out to clubs is to try to get this workshop to be something that is annual. Um, I'm also having discussions with trying to reach out and seeing if other uh, organizations outside of the university would be willing to sponsor this workshop. Um, in terms of the students' uh, participation, I can't guarantee anything. I, I surely hope that students really take uh, grasp onto this as the way I have and really use this more in their lives. I really like the educational component of this and trying to think about a more practical application, um, possibly working with the outdoor program being able to rent them to backpackers. Oh, yeah. Things like that. Oh, yeah. There's, there's definitely a, I, I've, I've heard some other people say, oh, I want that from like my camping trip. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much. So, now we're gonna have lunch. Um, so we have some box lunch next to our coffee and water over there. Um, I really encourage our student speakers that are speaking after lunch um, to go grab a box now. Um, so let's let them get their lunch first and then we'll meet back here at 12.15.
Um, you can keep eating while people are presenting. This is just some time to network a little bit and do that. Ryan? I just want to say one thing real quick. If we can give another hand, round of applause to the students. I know I, uh, I know I mentioned up front, but I just want to reiterate, like, what you're seeing here in terms of pitch and progress was literally after one week. Like, other than uh, Brandon, who has been working on this and it just fit this competition, everyone else literally learned about these problems within a week. And really what this teaches is what we teach at Venture College. You know, what we heard today was, look, window film is not a new invention, but it's too expensive for Boise State to implement. To your point, you know, the ROI of it, it doesn't make sense for them. But if they could find a sponsor tomorrow, we could have that. Right? And people are throwing away coffee grounds, and that could benefit the ecosystem here. And with just a small change of behavior and a tin bucket and a club to pick it up, you know, we can do that or make education more fun. So just wanted to really give uh, you know, credit to, to the students, and thanks so much for everyone's participation today. And, and just to add a note to that, as a social impact nonprofit like US Energy is, uh, we started doing events in 2014. And we've raised over a million dollars for community events over the span of 10 large scale. So all you know, sponsorship and community support is, is uh, relatively easy if you have a great network. And so that's what we're trying to build here, a community around actionable sustainability. So uh, we really appreciate you guys pitching here. And we hope to stay engaged and, and help you guys build out what you guys see. All right, thank you everyone. We'll meet back uh, at 12.15 and you can continue eating your lunch after that. All right, thank you.
Um, first and foremost, we're going to announce the winners of the Carbon Venture Challenge. Um, I will also invite you to keep snacking um, because we have some student speakers, but we recognize that 15 minutes is not very long to eat a whole box of lunch. Um, so feel free to keep snacking. Um, again, there's water and tea over there. Um, but yes, please find your seats. And without further ado, here's Ryan. All right, thanks everyone again. Uh, so on third place, so originally we were supposed to just have three teams. And uh, when we did preliminary judging on, on Wednesday, we saw four teams that definitely should be like continuing on after today. Like it's, they're viable, they're easy, low hanging fruit and wins. So uh, what's great is all four teams will qual qualify not only for initial funding now, but follow on funding if they hit, hit some milestones. And it's really excited to, to introduce that. So, for tied for third place is Team Composita and Team Efficiency. Second place is Solar Powered Workshop. And our winner of the competition is Sun Valley Solar and Brandon Yagla. Congratulations, Brandon and everyone else. Did you want to say some words? No. Just give it the, <laughs> the crazy scientist not wanting to say words. <laughs> All right, well, congratulations to everyone. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll talk about funding and more importantly, the follow-on funding, which means you hit your milestone. So congratulations, thanks everyone again. Okay, um, well, that's some very exciting news. Congratulations. Um, and I just wanna welcome everyone back and remind you to keep snacking. Um, we want you to eat the free food that we provided. Um, so a quick introduction on myself. My name is Skylar Benson. I use she, her pronouns. And I am the postgraduate fellow for campus sustainability. Um, thank you. 
Um, and so I graduated last May with a degree in biology and a minor in Spanish. And I was involved throughout the department um, as my time as a student. And so now um, I was offered the chance to stay on for a year after I graduated to really help students find their voices and feel empowered. Um, so I help manage and lead the team of awesome students that we have over here and here. Um, so we have some student staff, interns, and some work use students. So moving into our next portion of this event, we will have six student speakers. They will each have 10 minutes to present a project, some research, or even a passion that they would like to share with you today. And then they will have five minutes for questions at the end, so make sure to share your questions at the end. Um, I will be running the mic back and forth, so have some patience with that. We just want everyone who's virtual to be able to hear all the questions and responses. Um, now, because this is event is all about hearing from students, I just want to jump right in to our first speaker. Uh, I will give some short introductions. However, I encourage the students to introduce yourself more if you feel that is necessary. Um, so we're here for Students in Action. Our first student is Angela Seibert. She is a first year's Master's of Science Geoscience student at Boise State. She is a part of the Boise State Aeros Aerospace Lab and on the Geoscience Student Advisory Board and a part of the Community Garden Club. She will be presenting on pet lens and how, they're an, and how they are an essential carbon sink. Thank you, Skylar. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Angela Seibert. My pronouns are she, her. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I am a geoscience master's student, as Skylar said. I work in the Boise Center Aerospace Lab under my advisor, Dr. Nancy Glenn. Um, and I am working on a project that is part of a larger study known as SPRUCE, which stands for SPRUCE and Peatland Responses Under Changing Environments. Um, and that study is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about um, peatlands and how important they are as a carbon sink. Um, so in this presentation, I will be talking about two of our key responses to climate change as a society. Um, and then I'll get into what peatlands are and what's happening to them, and then my call to action for you today. So um, the first key response to climate change that we are doing as a society is adaptation. And these are actions that we are using to manage the impacts of climate change. Um, and so these show up usually in changes in infrastructure development. Um, and that can be seen in flood proofing buildings or rainwater harvesting in cities. And you can see that in the diagram here. Um, and then the second key component for our response to climate change is mitigation. And these are techniques that we're using to actually reduce emissions and meet our carbon neutral goals. And that's the one I'm going to be focusing on today, and that's the one that peatlands apply to. Um, so together, these key components equal climate resilience. And again, I'm talking um, mainly about mitigation. So peatlands are very strong wetlands. They're very strong carbon sinks. Um, they are present on every continent across the globe. They cover around 4 million square kilometers of land which is only about 3% of the Earth's total land surface. And you can see where peatlands are located um, in green on this figure. Um, and although they only cover 3% of the Earth's land, they store an estimated 44% of the global soil carbon estimates. Um, and that's 600 gigatons. And so how much is a gigaton? A gigaton is equivalent to 1 billion tons or 400,000 Olympic swimming pools. Um, and peatlands are able to store all this carbon because of how they function and how they have been formed. So peatlands form under um, uh, very low oxygen, highly acidic, um, low nutrient conditions. So vegetation substrate falls to the surface of these wetlands and it accumulates for thousands of years and forms what we all know as peat. Um, some of you might use peat in your gardens to retain water. Um, 
And so as this vegetation accumulates, the acidity and extremely low oxygen content um, creates an environment where microbial decomposition is extremely low and the accumulation rate is extremely high. Um, and so that leads to the stabilization and storage of all this carbon. Um, and here you can see that compared to a mineral soil wetland that you see on the left here, peatlands hold much more stable carbon. Um, uh, another characteristic of peatlands are the vegetation components that lead to the functionality of these bogs. One of those being the rising and falling um, mossy surface and then um, different vascular species such as conifer trees that you can see in the figure. Um, and here is um, an image of those different vegetation components. You can see kind of the rising and falling of the moss over here and then you can see the conifer trees. And these are essential components that help maintain the bogs or the peatlands functionality as a carbon sink. Um, and so that's me at the, the spruce study site, which I will go over more in the following slides. So with all these components and relative to the amount of land that they cover, peatlands actually store twice as much carbon as all the world's forests. However, they're being degraded. Um, here, you can see the pristine peatland that I showed you earlier, and this is how they harvest peat and bring it to be used for um, gardening or fuel, um, or they clear this land to plant conifer trees that are used for paper pulp or palms that we use for palm oil. Um, and you can see that they rip up all that very important vegetation, and then they proceed to vacuum the peat for 12 to 40 years. So it's estimated that around 16% of all the world's peatlands are significantly degraded. And um, this degradation is characterized just by drying of the peatland, lowering of the water table that makes it up since it is a wetland. Um, and with this drainage, we're seeing increased fire frequency inside peatlands. And when peatlands catch on fire, they're nearly impossible to put out because of the amount of organic matter that they hold and all that fuel. Um, and then we're also seeing an increase in greenhouse gas emissions because with the lowering of the water table and the heating up of that area, um, microbial decomposition rates are increasing again from where they were extremely low. And now all that stored carbon is being emitted as methane and carbon dioxide. Um, and so 16% of the world's peatlands are degraded, meaning they make up around 0.3% of the Earth's total land surface but um, they make up 5% of all anthropogenic global carbon emissions, which is insane relative to how much land they cover. That's 1.5 gigatons or 600,000 Olympic swimming pools every year. Um, it's estimated that restoring all the world's damaged peatlands would mitigate um, the European Union's, all their current carbon emissions, although this study was done in 2018. And recently I saw that the European Union's carbon emissions are actually 2.5 gigatons. So <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so the spruce site, the study that I'm working on right now, um, is looking at how drying peatlands are emitting this carbon dioxide and how much they are actually emitting. Um, and so here you can see that they're threatening to release 860 million tons of carbon dioxide by the year 2100. Um, and so the purpose of my research with Spruce and the BCAL lab at Boise State is to characterize how these peatlands are changing in response to elevated carbon dioxide and elevated temperature levels projected by the IPCC reports. And so I'm doing this by using um, terrestrial LIDAR, which is an active remote sensing technique. It essentially uses a laser beam, which scans the peatland. And then I'm developing three-dimensional models to look at how the vegetation and that mossy rising and falling surface is changing um, in response to those different projected levels of warming. Um, and here you can see that um, they've taken this peatland in northern Minnesota and sectioned it off into these chambers where they're under elevated carbon dioxide levels and elevated temperature levels. So that's where all of this is happening. And here's an example of a terrestrial LIDAR point cloud that I can obtain just by putting that scanner on the ground. 
Um, you can see we can get a wide, uh, large amount of data. And then here's an example of a plot that I'm looking at. And so essentially, I'm looking at how these trees change over time and quantifying that. So my call to action to you today to mitigate um, our carbon emissions using peelins is to support um, bills like S1201, which support the Paris Climate Agreement, and then avoiding companies that drain peatlands for paper pulp and palm oil um, production, like PepsiCo and Cargill, um, and then also trying out peat alternatives in your garden, such as compost or coconut fiber, which also retain water well. Here are my references. And thank you very much. <laughs>
so peelings form over the course of thousands of years and they form because of the type of soil that's present in that environment so um, and that soil came about from the melting of huge glaciers that used to be that used to exist in those temperate regions I am working in Min Minnesota and so they say it was the soil was formed from a glacial lake um, and so those soils have extremely low drainage and that's why the water builds up um, in those areas and it, um, it creates that really low oxygen environment and you need high acidity and you need low nutrients um, for that peat to just store. Um, so I guess you could technically incorporate that soil if you brought it in um, into that area. However, I would think you would have to um, remove peat from already existing peelings um, and then inundate that area with water um, yeah, I'm not sure if that, I, I mean, that soil is probably available in other regions that aren't necessarily part of peelings and aren't necessarily as fragile, but I do know that the overall goal, um, especially after listening to the talks about regener regenerative farming, that we just don't want to break up our soils and, you know, um, but I do really want to help with fire. <laughs> <laughs> and those issues. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so our next speaker is Jukes Liu, who is a graduate student at Boise State and a PH candidate. And as well, she's involved with the geosciences graduate organization. She will present a brief overview on snow and glacier changes in a warming climate and her research on recent glacier changes in the Arctic. Okay. Hello everyone. My name is Jukes Liu. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm also a graduate student in the Department of Geosciences here at Boise State University. And today I'm gonna to be talking about our changing cryosphere from a research perspective. So the term cryosphere just refers to all forms of frozen water on our planet. And today I'm gonna to be specifically talking about snow and glaciers. Nowadays, with the explosion in the number of satellites that are monitoring the Earth's surface, it's now easier than ever for researchers to monitor regional and global scale changes to snow and ice. So snow and ice, our cryosphere, uh, plays a really important role in our water cycle and water storage, especially in mountainous regions. So the amount of snowfall that we get up in the mountains affects how much water is available to the rivers downstream in the spring and summer. And we can feel the effects of that living right here <laughs> in Idaho. This is a map from a recent study that shows the global change in snow cover days. Um, and this analysis is done using satellite data. So with the blue regions, these are showing areas where we're seeing an increase in the number of snow cover days. And the red areas are showing regions where we're actually seeing a decrease in snow cover days. And the big takeaway from this map is that there are some pretty variable patterns overall, and different regions are experiencing different amounts of change. So it'll be important to monitor these changes carefully moving forward. Glaciers also play an important role in water storage and cycling, and glacier melt contributes to global sea level rise. This is a map showing the global changes in glacier mass over the last 20 years and each circle corresponds to the mass change for each region. So the size of the circle is scared, scaled to how much mass change is happening. See these negative numbers are indicating mostly mass loss around the world. And the blue portion of the circles corresponds to the contribution from marine glaciers. These glaciers end in the ocean, and so their meltwater runoff goes directly into the ocean and can contribute directly to sea level rise. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> and the gray portion of the circle corresponds to the contribution from the glaciers that exist only on land. 
And below the circles, we have these timelines that show the rate of glacier mass loss for each region through the last 20 years, with more recent years on the right-hand side. And so these oranges and reds are indicating high rates of mass loss. So in some regions, we're seeing increases in the rates of mass loss, but again, there are pretty variable patterns all around. So what is causing this variability in snow and ice change as climate changes? Um, it's not as simple as saying that warming air temperatures will reduce snow and ice cover everywhere. Um, the cryosphere interacts with the global climate system in several different ways, and there are both positive and negative feedback cycles. So for example, if we look at these graphs on the left, these are showing a pattern called Arctic amplification. Some of you might have heard about this before, but it just refers to the continued increase in air temperatures in the Arctic, in part resulting from a feedback cycle involving the continued loss of snow and ice there. So snow and ice have a really high albedo, which means that they're really good at reflecting energy from the sun. So as we lose snow, and especially sea ice in the Arctic, there's less reflection of that energy from the sun and more of it is being absorbed into the ocean and land there. That in turn can warm uh, air temperatures and uh, result in more loss of snow and ice. So you can see there's a potentially vicious feedback cycle that can result from this. And so as a result, we're seeing this continued increase in air temperatures um, due to this amplification effect. And the last several IPCC reports have discussed this. Unfortunately, indigenous people are disproportionately affected by this amplification effect. Now that's not very uplifting to think about, um, but on the bright side, not all cryosphere climate interactions result in these vicious feedbacks, feedback cycles. Um, and some processes actually have the opposite effect. So this example on the right, uh, we're looking at the Atlantic Ocean, Greenland's over here, and we have the Arctic Ocean up to the north. The meltwater from Greenland is really cold and fresh, and that runs off into the surrounding ocean. And the input of that cold and fresh water can alter ocean circulation patterns. And recent studies have found that that meltwater can actually slow some of the ocean circulation that transports heat to the poles. And so actually increased meltwater from Greenland might slow some of the ocean warming in the Arctic. So when considering future changes due to climate, you have to consider how these different feedbacks interact and how they balance or don't balance each other out. There are people here at Boise State that are actively uh, conducting research on these topics. And we are part of the CryoGARS research group in the Department of Geosciences. I uh, primarily study glacier changes in the Arctic and the subarctic. And my advisor is Dr. Ellen Enderlin, who specializes in glaciology and remote sensing. Dr. H.P. Marshall studies changes to snow and how to measure that with radar instruments. He's also led a large NASA campaign over the last several years focused on snow measurements in the western U.S. and Alaska. And Dr. Anna Bergstrom joined us last year. She is a mountain hydrologist and has also worked with ice cores. And these other photos are showing some of the local research activities that uh, the undergraduate and graduate students have been able to participate in over the last several years. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk briefly about a project that I worked on over the last several years where I was measuring glacier retreat for the marine glaciers around Greenland. So typically to measure glacier retreat over time, we trace the edge of the glacier, which is also called its terminus, in repeat images over the glacier. And so we can look at how the glacier is moving forward and back. And so when we're doing this manually, and if we want to look at hundreds of glaciers at many different time points, this can become really time consuming. And so I developed an automated way for tracing glacier edges in satellite images. And so we're seeing these automated traces here in this animation, and we can extract this record of retreat and see with this efficient method, we can grab data from many different time points throughout the year. And so we can actually see these seasonal fluctuations in glacier advance and retreat 
corresponding to advance in the winter and spring and retreat in the summer. But then we can also look at these trends over multiple years really easily. I applied this to the glaciers in southeast Greenland, where previous work has found some pretty dramatic changes to the Greenland ice sheet. And with my automated method, I created records for 135 glaciers in this region in just 18 hours. And I found that 56 of these glaciers underwent an anomalous retreat event in 2016. So these three graphs here are showing what I mean by an anomalous retreat event. So this is the glacier terminus position, and the anomalous retreat corresponds to a large magnitude of retreat in 2016 that stands out from the other years. Or is the glacier initiated a gradual retreat over many years starting in 2016, or some combination of the two. So these 56 glaciers were spread all across southeast Greenland, and these pie charts are showing the relative presence of these three retreat types, and the size of the pie corresponds to how many glaciers in each degree of latitude experience this anomalous retreat. And so it's really surprising that these glaciers spread so far across southeast Greenland in different catchments all retreated around the same time. And so that pointed us to a climate driver for this retreat event. And so I looked into atmospheric and ocean warming, which both can influence marine glacier retreat. So increase in ocean temperatures can increase the amount of melting at the glacier terminus. When the atmosphere warms, that creates more surface melting on the glacier, and that meltwater can pool up and run off and enter these cracks in the glacier called crevasses. Some of these reach all the way down to the bottom of the glacier. So the water then flows um, along the bottom of the glacier and gets released at the terminus. Remember that water is really fresh, so it rises up buoyantly above the salty ocean water right along the terminus. That produces a lot of mixing, and so we get more melting of the glacier. And so I examined these two factors and how they might influence that retreat event. Um, I grabbed ocean temperatures from a global ocean model and surface melting from a regional climate model. And I found that ocean temperatures were actually relatively stable over this time period. So this figure on the left is showing ocean temperatures above and below the average for the time period, which is shown by these red lines. So if we look at 2016, highlighted by this pink box, we see that it doesn't stand out as a warmer year. And none of these years really stand out as anomalously warm. So ocean temperatures is not likely to be the culprit for this retreat event. On the other hand, surface melting tells us a different story. So this is the cumulative amount of surface melt or runoff for each year for all of these glaciers. We see that 2016 is elevated above the other years. We did a statistical analysis and found that the average surface runoff in 2016 was significantly above the average for the other years. And so we have this anomalous surface melting event that coincides with that pronounced retreat anomaly um, amongst all the glaciers in southeast Greenland um, in the study. And so uh, we found that atmospheric induced surface melting could promote this kind of widespread retreat amongst these types of glaciers. It's one of the first studies that indicate that these particular glaciers can respond really sensitively to atmospheric changes. And so uh, we might need to reconsider how we account for these glaciers retreat when we're predicting future changes due to climate. And I just wanted to end really quickly um, with discussing how we can connect our research with broader audiences because as researchers we publish these papers and they go into scientific journals that other scientists read but um, more commonly other scientists within our specific field um, and even if our studies make it into an IPCC report that reaches policymakers and you know a handful of people who actually dive into these huge reports that get released every several years um, and so, as researchers, we want to bridge that gap. A lot of us are interested in expanding our climate.
solution languages. And so our research group tries to do a lot of outreach to local schools in Boise, where we talk to young people about changes to glaciers and snow and the ocean. Um, and I'm grateful for events like this, where we can all connect and discuss about these issues together. If you're interested in getting involved in research and you're a student here, um, here are some things to look into and feel free to reach out to me or the administrators in our department to get connected. Thank you very much. So we just have time for one question um, and feel free to raise your hand. Uh, hi, <clears throat> um, thank you for your great presentation. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you went about building the automation process that you use to, f to gather your data. So this research project that I work on was actually born from an interdisciplinary idea where uh, some researchers in the biomedical engineering department were using a type of image analysis technique to actually um, analyze mammograms. But um, some of the researchers in the Department of Earth Sciences that I was involved in uh, listened to a talk by him and got inspired and thought, oh, we could use this on satellite images to look at changes to the environment. And so um, I was brought on to this project. I uh, basically made a workflow to download all these satellite images and process them. And the method basically looks at the changes in brightness in the image and automatically identifies high contrast features like the glacier terminus. Is that enough detail or would you like more? Yeah, that's so great. <laughs> I, love that, um, I love that it's so interdisciplinary. Right? <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Really cool. Super cool. A lot of cool work can come from more collaboration across different fields and sciences. And just, I'll just add, I'd love to help you. You've got great outreach stuff already, um, and so let's just build on that. So, okay, the slime, yeah. the glacial slime is a big hit. So. Yes, it totally <laughs> is. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much. Um, that was a really interesting question, Ben, and I love the answer to that. Um, it's really cool just to use existing research. Um, okay, next up, we have Skylar Barzi, um, who is a senior at Idaho Virtual Academy. They are involved in the Wind and Fire Lab at Boise State and are a member of the Boise Youth Climate Action Council and have received the NASA Earth Systems Award at the Idaho, Idaho Science and Engineering Fair. Skylar will present the research that got them that award and that looks at the carbon sequestration efficacy of rubber rabbit brush. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> a plant which is native to Idaho. They will cover the basics of carbon sequestration to how native plants are often more beneficial to the environment than other species. Thank you, Skylar. Oh, I came up a little early. Oh, oh well, I tried my best. Okay. So yeah, I'll just be showcasing um, the research that I did and how I kind of introducing how I got involved with that. Um, so to begin, I'm looking at rubber rabbit brush, which is a plant that is native to Idaho. Um, it's really beneficial species for pollinators and it's great at stabilizing ecosystems. And so the reason why I'm so enamored with this plant specifically is it's a wonderful foil to cheatgrass because it is able to establish itself very quickly, um, specifically at risk areas like sides of the road. Um, rubber rabbit brush can establish itself really quickly. It is also easily manually propagated. Um, Hyatt Hidden Lakes Reserve, which is actually where I ended up doing um, my sample collection, it was overrun by cheatgrass, and I believe it was in 2016, the Boise River team ended up ripping out the cheatgrass and volunteers manually propagated rubber rabbit brush um, just because it is able to establish itself so quickly. So now it's everywhere at the site. Um, I initially visited Hyatt Hidden Lakes for a project for my environmental science class 
and our goal was to just uh, make ecosystem observations teaching us about biotic versus abiotic factors. And I noticed that uh, rubber rabbit brush specifically was everywhere. So my initial concern was that it could be an invasive species. Um, however, upon some further research, I discovered that, um, like I mentioned before, it's great for pollinators and good for stabilizing ecosystems. And so the carbon sequestration part of my question came from my time on the Boise Youth Climate Action Council. Up at the Boise Urban Garden Center, we built a carbon sequestration garden with signage um, educating the populace about it which um, it's already been explained by other presentations today, but basically a plant in an area will sequester carbon from the atmosphere, so it's a very effective method at uh, reducing CO2 without a lot of human intervention. So for some of my background research, um, I just looked at uh, the introduction of rubber rabbit brush into high hidden lakes and how soil carbon levels are influenced by plant biodiversity, so that native versus non-native species. And so for my methods and materials, I collected my samples at Hyatt Hidden Lakes. Um, the experimentals were near the base of the rubber rabbit brush plants and the control samples was just an area without a visible plant. And um, through an email to Dr. DeGroff of the biology department, she invited me to process her samples in her lab. And um, Mrs. Pervet, the STEM research teacher, um, had a graduate student here that she knew that connected me to Dr. Reynard and who then connected me to Dr. Huber. So that's how I got involved with processing my samples here. So um, the process, it was wonderful for me as just a high school student to experience some basic lab work. Um, initially, the plan was I was just going to be sending it into some random lab, but here I was able to get some hand-on experience in a methodology of fighting climate change. So um, I prepared my samples for analysis using a CHN elemental analyzer so that essentially blasts the sample and separates it into two different gases, um, nitrogen gas and carbon gas, and it'll tell you the um, percentage of carbon within each sample by telling you the percentage of carbon dioxide. I managed to only look at organic carbon because I ran a hydrochloric acid fumigation process to get rid of the inorganic carbon because I just wanted to look at organic carbon. And so that presents the percentage of carbon within these numbers. And so I had very low levels of carbon. Um, I was mainly looking near the third and second soil horizon, which upon looking back, I should have included some more of the horizons. However, there was somewhat close resembling a normal distribution, so I felt comfortable running a t-test on my results. Um, the t-test was a bit too high, greater than 0.05%, so my results are statistically insignificant for now in regards to the relation of rubber rabbit brush influencing organic carbon levels. However, I believe that with more samples and perhaps processing some more horizons, I'd be able to get some more concrete data, as there was a bit more um, carbon percent or present in the rubber rabbit brush samples compared to the control samples. A point, uh, zero 0.02 difference, so not a whole lot, but I would like to look into it more. Um, I'm also curious within cheatgrass and velvet grass specifically how they uh, store carbon, just because they're everywhere, invasive species. Um, clearly, they're a great fire risk, but I am also interested in if they are sequestering carbon. So there are my references, and I suppose my call to action is to listen to young people. <laughs> We're the ones that are going to be dealing with climate change. Um, like Dr. Pierce mentioned, there's a rally at the steps of the Capitol happening right now, and that's where I would be, where I'm not invited to present here. And so um, just realizing that we're trying our best and that any opportunity you can afford us, like having someone like me prepare samples is wonderful. And yeah, I guess that's everything. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Again, we have time for maybe like two or three questions, so feel free to raise your hand. Skylar, it's been so amazing to have you um, helping out in the lab. So just so everyone is clear, Skylar is a um, is a high school student, um, but um, they are doing amazing university um, level research. So my question is, what are you going to do next? So you're off to the U of I Honors College. Um, what are you most interested in, um, in studying there? What are going to be um, your languages of climate solutions? So I think carving out my own little niche, um, I'm interested in the intersection of psychology and climate change. So how people 
um, perceive talks about climate change and how they are able to respond best to influencing um, positive actions regarding sustainability. And so I think most of my undergraduate time I'm going to try to focus on um, soil ecology and specifically carbon storage. That's what I've been working on and I find it really fascinating. But um, I'd love to minor in psychology and start analyzing the relationships between a problem that's going to be haunting us for decades unless we start doing something about it and how that's going to affect the psyche of young people like me who are raised with this looming threat over all of us from sixth grade science class. My teacher instilled when in me that this is something that we have to deal with. So I'm curious how that has um, affected our perception of issues like this. So um, yeah, I'd like to go on for a PhD. I don't know if that's a good idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so um, yeah, probably soil ecology, um, similar to what you guys are doing here. So yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? I have a comment really quick. Um, the director of sustainability at Boise State, who is not actually here today, unfortunately, but um, she got her master's in a major here that she created herself, um, and it's on climate anxiety. And so she paired a bunch of different majors together um, and looked at how we can deal with climate anxiety through art. Um, and so you should talk to her about um, kind of pairing the more um, you know, scientific with the societal view of climate change and the stress that comes with that. Yes. Any last minute questions? No. Okay, let's give Skylar a big round of applause. So next up, we have Pangea Finn, who is a junior at Boise State and is involved in the orangutan gang which is a conservation organization. She will remind us that every day, thousands of acres in Southeast Asia rainforests are burned to make room for palm oil plantations. Every day, palm oil inf infiltrates hundreds of grocery store products, becoming an essential ingredient in our everyday lives. The palm oil industry's environmental crimes put people, primates, and the planet at risk. But we can choose to make a difference, to stand up for the rainforest and put our environmental first. Please welcome up Pangea. Hi, I am so glad to be here today talking to all of these wonderful people who are so interested in sustainability. And I am going to be talking about palm oil. You probably already heard my introduction about how I am going to tell you about how you can help save the rainforest just by making simple choices in the foods that you eat and the people that you tell about this. So, first off, I wanna start by introducing orangutans, which are sort of the mascot or the poster species for this campaign. Orangutans are great apes. They share actually 97% DNA with humans, so super close relatives of us. And according to some meta-analyses, they are even more intelligent than their relatives, chimpanzees. They're better at learning and problem-solving tasks. That puts them right behind us in terms of intelligence. They live in very dense rainforest in East Asia. In fact, their habitat is so biodiverse that 15% of the world's birds, amphibians, and reptile species live in that rainforest with orangutans. This is a very important habitat. It's um, often underappreciated, and it's also being destroyed. And I'll get to that. Orangutans, other facts about orangutans, they are the largest tree-living animal in the world. They live almost entirely in trees and spend um, a little over 5% of their time on the ground, and the rest is spent in trees. And one species hasn't even been observed to come down to the ground. Um, orangutans have the longest childhood of almost any other species besides humans. So orangutan babies will stay with their mothers up to 8 to 10 years of age. And during that time, they will learn everything that they need to know about how to survive in the wilderness and how they can, um, how they can basically how, how to survive. So um, they are very important animals. They are intelligent, they are caring, and they, some have even shown signs of culture, which the technical definition of this is when different populations have different behaviors. So uh, behaviors will appear in one population that aren't visible in others, and that's a sign of culture. So orangutans have actually displayed this. Unfortunately, 
they are critically endangered. And this is due to a number of factors, poaching, pet trade, mostly habitat loss. This is a serious issue. Why is their habitat being destroyed? Let's get to this. Short answer is palm oil. So much of this rainforest is being destroyed due to palm oil. In fact, um, Indonesia and Malaysia, which are the countries where orangutans live, produce, I want to say, 75% of the world's palm oil production. And they produce all of this on land, or nearly all of this on land that used to be rainforest. So what happens is the rainforest will get destroyed, burned down, or logged, or otherwise um, demolished. And palm oil plantations will be planted in the space where that rainforest is. You can sort of see this happening in the background of this picture. The land is being um, prepared for palm oil plantations. These are monocrops. Animals cannot live there. They are very, um, there is a lot of pesticides going on in this area, so it's not healthy for any other species. And it has a number of other negative consequences. First of all is clearly habitat loss. Second of all, when this rainforest is destroyed, it contributes to global warming. The rainforest is burned. All of these carbon sinks that are in these forests are just being completely destroyed, and the carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere. These are also terrible fires that essentially ruin the air quality in the area. So um, this is a big contributor to climate change. It's also a major cause of human rights abuses, is these plantations, because um, workers are not being fa fairly treated. They will be treated with, um, they won't have health benefits, they won't have, um, they have low salaries and enormously high quotas to meet. Often there's even modern slavery or even child labor on these plantations. In addition, um, it's not just rainforest that's being destroyed. Indigenous people are often forced off their lands in order to make room for these plantations. So it's bad all around, basically. The palm oil industry justifies this by saying that palm oil is good for your heart or that it's cheaper than other oils or that it's more efficient because it produces more oil per area of crop. But that ignores the main big problem, which is that palm oil is bad for people, primates, for planet. It is creating all of these problems because these plantations are taking over these countries and these natural areas. So I want to talk about how you can help save the rainforest. As you probably heard um, my intro mention, palm oil is an issue because it's very prominent in grocery store products. 50% of grocery store products, if you just go to the grocery store and you look at the ingredients, it will contain palm oil or some palm oil derivative. And you can see that this issue is really serious because palm oil is present in all of our daily lives in so many of the things that we eat, that we take in, that we use. It's in products like shampoo, toothpaste, pet food, biodiesel, milk, snack food, um, chocolate, all of these other foods that are very familiar to you. And I see some of you looking in your boxes to check the ingredients. And yes, I'm not sure about that. I haven't checked on that, but it's certainly possible. And a lot of the time, the reason that it's hard to tell is because palm oil has a number of aliases. So some of these are derivatives of palm oil. Some of these are way further down and they're just chemicals that are isolated from palm oil. Sometimes it can be hard to tell what is palm oil and what is just some other chemical that isn't familiar. So the list that I use for myself is I will use these six words that are almost always present in palm oil derivative names. And that is palm, lore, cetal, glyc, steer, ole. You're not going to remember that on the first time, but there is lots of information about this online that you can find. And I also can repeat to you that list in the questions if you're curious or it's on my website. So there are a number of other resources that you can use for this. There are scanner apps. There are websites that um, have lists of products that don't contain palm oil alternati alternatives to common products like Oreo or Ritz crackers or Nutella that are pretty well known to contain palm oil. So if you're looking for that, there is lots of information about that that I can also help you with. So that's about boycotting palm oil. Different people have different views on this. Some people believe that boycotting palm oil is just not going to help. It's not big enough. My general take is yes, it is big enough. It is definitely something that's going to help, but only if you also spread the word. This is so important. 
This is a major serious issue and change will only be created if we get more people to know about it. So this is what I'm doing right now. I'm telling all you guys about this issue, getting you to help save the rainforest. And um, you can do the same thing. You can tell your friends about this issue. There's lots of information that you can share. And um, I'll also give you the link to my website at the end of this presentation so you can share that and learn more. Finally, um, it's important to contact companies. Remember to let these companies that are using palm oil know about how unsustainable they're being. There are form letters. Um, there are usually contact forms on company websites where you can include this information. Tell them how they're being unsustainable. Tell them that you find that not helpful for the environment and that they need to stop using this completely unsustainable ingredient. Finally, you'll see at the bottom, I have couch conservation. And that's this term that I use for three major things that you can do. Contact a company, send out a form letter. You don't even really have to do any work for this. Just copy some text, paste it, send it to the company. Two, tell a couple of friends. This doesn't have to be serious. This doesn't have to be a speech. Use social media. Just tell friends about the palm oil issue, get them to make a difference. And number three is choose a few alternative products that you can buy instead of products containing palm oil and add those to your market list. Make that a permanent change. These are simple things that you can do. You don't even need to get up from your couch. So I am gonna go ahead and challenge you to try all of those things. Um, after you listen to this presentation, try these things today. Make a difference about this issue. And one of the best resources for this is my website. Hooray. So I work with the orangutan gang. I basically am the orangutan gang. This is my conservation organization that you can find out more about on the website, orangutangang.org. We have tons of resources. We have information about palm oil free products. We have, um, we even have s several lesson plans. If you're interested in using lesson plans, we have those for students of all levels. Um, we have petitions and a pledge that you can take to become the um, to become an orangutan supporter, and lots of information that you can find from conservation leaders, from people who are trying to help save the rainforest, and you can become one of those people yourself. So, my final message that I'll le leave you with is: remember that this is an issue you can make a difference on. This is an issue that you are already contributing to through products that you're using every day. But don't lose heart because that means that your contributions can also turn this around. So if you make a difference, if you sit down, you do a couple of little things, you can actually help save the rainforest. Everyone can do that. And if we all really work for it, we're going to be able to save the rainforest. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. And do we have um, any questions? What was one of the first replacements you found? Or what was one of the first steps you took into taking palm oil out of your life? You heard me mention a few palm oil containing products. I said Nutella, Ritz, Oreo. Those are basically the most prominent products that you'll see on any list that contain palm oil. It's those three and milk. So there are replacement products for each of those. I use an off-brand hazelnut spread called Nocciolata. I use off-brand crackers that are um, townhouse or something that, like that that you can usually find in most stores. and. Um, I don't eat Oreos, so there's also that. You can find off-brand ones at Whole Foods that are totally fine. As for milk, palm oil is in a lot of different kinds of milk, but almost never in whole milk. So if you check on skim milk or 2% milk or any of those things, you, you'll usually say vitamin A palmitate, which is a thin disguise. Um, but whole milk typically doesn't contain that. So if you're looking to find palm oil-free products, just um, you can use a couple of apps. There are some apps that will let you scan barcodes and figure out what products contain palm oil. And of course, there are um, websites like Products Without Palm Oil that have lists of products that are palm oil free as alternatives to popular products. Um, do milk alternatives like almond milk and oat milk have palm oil? Do you know? 
I'm not entirely certain about that. Those are not products that I use on a regular basis, but I would say I think it's unlikely that products like that would use palm oil. But you can always check the ingredients. Usually in dairy products, you'll find it under vitamin A palmitate. So you can check for that. I was just wondering if you could repeat the uh, other palm oil names, because I want to get that down. Yeah, of course. So the six that are most common are palm, glyc, the um, G-L-Y-C, Olay, you'll see that in oleic acid or Olayus gnansis, um, cetal, steer, and um, lore. So you might see those in cetal alcohol or sodium lauryl sulfate or stearic acid. Those are kind of the most common ones that you'll see. Great presentation. I actually got to hang out with some orangutans in Indonesia and it was uh, unforgettable. I would love to hear you record this for the Climate Stories project. So um, maybe we can follow up about that. That would be wonderful. Yeah, definitely let's get, in con let's get in touch with that. And there are actually a number of videos on my website where I explain this slightly more slowly and fully and completely. So um, you can also look at those if you'd like more information. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question, if we have any. There's a great workshop that's offered here at Boise State. Um, it's under Anthropology 494 and 294, as well as Biology 494 and 294. And it focuses on primate conservation. And the presenter for it does a really great job of discussing palm oil, palm oil alternatives, and how to do conservation for primates, specifically in that environment as well. That's fantastic. I was not aware of that. Thank you for that. I will definitely check that out. Well, let's give one more round of applause. Awesome. Um, so we have two more student speakers. The next is Paul Venable, who is a senior at Boise State and is a campus sustainability program manager, as well as founder and director of Trash Club Boise. Paul will speak about Trash Club's unique approach to reducing litter in our community and the, the success and impact Trash Club has had and how community members can get involved in the club. Thank you, Skylar. Um, so my presentation is not nearly as science-y as the previous presentations, but I hope I can uh, make it somewhat interesting. Uh, so my name is Paul Venable. I am a senior at Boise State majoring in business, but my heart is ultimately in public policy. And I am, um, you know, as Skylar mentioned, um, a programs coordinator for campus sustainability and the founder and director of Trash Club Boise. Uh, Trash Club Boise is a standalone nonprofit uh, with the mission to keep the Treasure Valley as litter-free as possible. We have so far, since our founding in 2020, cleaned up over 4,000 pounds of trash off the streets uh, of Treasure Valley, uh, but we really think that's an underestimate. We think the true number is closer to 5,000 pounds of trash, and that's, you know, been with the hours of work from myself and hundreds of volunteers and organizations across the Treasure Valley. So it's just awesome. But one thing I'm often told by volunteers is, hey, Paul, why, why is this important, right? Isn't this whole mission of getting rid of litter kind of a hopeless one, right? And it's easy to think that. You know, you think you drive down the road, okay, if I pick up this piece of litter, of course, the next day it's going to be there. And, you know, going out there and doing this every week, y you sometimes begin to get in that mindset. But I'm here to say that that's, that's not a good way of thinking. <laughs> At the end of the day, if we have this hopeless mindset that nothing's ever going to get better, that just causes you to kind of go in the corner and panic and fear, and nothing ultimately gets done. And I think that's so important to relate to climate change, because so often, and you know, my supervisor, Kat Davis, she talks about this a lot, people get scared, right? It's easy to look at a lot of the data, a lot of the, the rhetoric and stuff, and, and think, hey, this is really scary. What 
what what can I do? Like, where is the hope? But there is hope. Small changes add up. Individual efforts add up. And the actions you take as individuals are actions that are seen by other people and it ultimately spreads. And that's what we've seen with Trash Club. We started in 2020, and one of the areas we hit most often is downtown Boise. This was in uh, June 2020, so right after lockdown. And despite Boise opening up, despite life coming back, and despite things returning to a somewhat normalcy, we've seen a decrease in litter. Not an increase. You'd think more people increase in litter, but we haven't seen an increase. We've seen a decrease, which I know there's a number of factors that can play into that. But I like to think that Trash Club has played some sort of role in that because we've been going out there quite often to downtown Boise, picking up litter. And I think people see us. They see us walking around and doing this. They see that, hey, their neighbors, their friends, their coworkers are out there and they're picking up litter and they care enough about their community to pick up litter. So maybe I shouldn't litter myself, right? And that's one of the things that Trash Club is founded off of. We're trying to set this precedent here in Treasure Valley that litter is not welcome despite the growth, despite the rapid changes, despite the um, you know, crazy social and political climate we're in, we're here to set this unifying precedent that, hey, in the Treasure Valley, no matter who you are, we don't support litter. And that is so important. And as hopeless as some people think our mission is, like I said, in downtown Boise, we have seen a shift. We have seen less litter. We have seen it coming back a lot less. The variety, the types of litter, right? Um, we've been seeing less, less different types of litter, and it's been super cool to see that. And it's super cool to see that after all this work, we've actually been able to see some sort of effort, and we're hoping to eventually bring that to more areas in Boise and more areas in the Treasure Valley. So I just felt that uh, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit, but going to switch gears a little bit and kind of talk a little bit more about the, you know, the sciencey side of it, I like to say, just kind of like what we've seen in our waste patterns and what we've seen and, and what, what's being tossed out. So a question I'm asked quite often is, hey, Paul, where is the place where you find the most litter? And to that, I easily say it's, it's State Street. <laughs> Um, if you aren't from here, State Street is a major road um, a little bit north of downtown, and that is by far where we see the most litter. It's on uh, dirt lots where there's, you know, people just kind of don't maintenance it, and, um, you know, we just see a whole lot of uh, dumping activity there. Um, same, we see a lot of litter on the sides of roads, and State's another great example of that, where people, you know, either they intentionally or unintentionally, I like to believe more unintentionally, toss stuff out of their car and it falls into the road margins, and um, you know nobody really comes around to clean it up. So that you know is easy where easily where we see the most trash. Now in terms of what kinds of trash we see, we do see a lot of cigarette butts. That is our number one thing we pick up, just cigarette butts left and right. Which fun fact, a lot of people think cigarette butts decompose, but they don't. They have plastic fibers in the filters. Um, so if anybody tells you. You know, I toss my cigarette butt out on the ground because it's disposable. Tell them no, it, it, it's not going to compost. It's got plastic fibers, and because it's plastic, it's not going to it's not going to decompose. Also, if you throw a cigarette butt on an asphalt surface, there is nothing really there to break it down, so you can't expect it to decompose. <laughs> um, but yeah, cigarette butts are by far the number one thing we see. Um, aside from that, we we see a lot of masks, though less so um, recently. Um, and we see a whole lot of um, drink cups, food items, uh, you know, alcoholic uh, cans and beverages and whatnot. Um, you know, those are all the, the top things we see. And then, of course, on major roads, you, you see your fair share of different car parts and um, stuff that came out of an accident, uh, like a car accident. No one just ever came back to clean it up. Um, but, yeah, so that's, that's just a little bit about Trash Club, um, you know, kind of to summarize. First, there is this mindset that a lot of this stuff, a lot of the things we're talking about, like, you know, some people are like, hey, this is kind of hopeless, but I'm here to say it, it's not hopeless at all. Small changes add up. Our individual efforts do matter. And with enough time, they do really make a difference. And, uh, you know, I just really want to, I really want to um, hammer that in, I guess. Um, and then second, um, you know, Trash Club, um, we have seen the most amount of litter on State Street and kind of the big roads. A lot of cigarette butts. So if you know anybody who smokes, make sure they don't th throw their cigarette 
make sure they don't throw their cigarette butts on the ground. Um, and yeah. So just finally, I want to close off by saying if you want to get involved with Trash Club, we have tons of community pickups open to anyone. We don't care uh, how much you know about litter, how much you know about picking up litter. We will try to train you to the best of our ability. Anybody's welcome at our pickups. Um, if you would like to join us, you can go to our website at www.trashclubusa.org or Instagram slash Facebook at Trash Club underscore Boise. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, any questions from the audience? So after a pickup, what does the process look like? Like right after, do you sort through the trash? What happens to the trash? And kind of what's that aftermath process look like? So as much as we would like to be able to sort through stuff and you know properly recycle and properly compost things that can be composted, it's um, just too much of a safety hazard to do that. Um, you know, there's things we, uh, things we pick up like glass, uh, hypodermic needles, right? Um, hazardous waste that we just don't feel safe having our volunteers and I don't feel safe going through it. Um, so typically we just throw it away in a location where we are allowed to throw it away, right? Because we, we can't just throw it away anywhere. That would be private dumping if we don't get the explicit approval of whoever owns the trash receptacle. Um, but, you know, we throw it away where we can and, and that's just kind of how we do it. I just have kind of a fun question. Um, what I what are the most interesting things that you guys have picked up? That's a question we actually get quite often. Um, so I always like to tell folks that um, back when we first started, there was some sort of like nerf battle going on on campus. I think it was with uh, the Greek life program or something. but. Uh, we found a bunch of Nerf guns, um, and a lot of them were too dirty to, I feel like, really keep them, but it was still really interesting. Um, we've also found, um, I mean, some stuff I probably shouldn't be talking about in, a <laughs> in, in an event like this, um, but, you know, uh, some car parts with interesting um, par paraphernalia on them, for lack of better words. Um, we've found... Um, some like notes right like we found some love letters you know where somebody's like writing to something and you know you get like the love letter and like the flower next to it and it's like oh man something really crappy must have happened here <laughs> um i always like to tell <laughs> like always like to say sometimes the trash almost tells stories like you know like i said you get like the letter and there's like a flower and you know it's like oh boy like i feel bad for this person <laughs> so yeah i hope that answers your question Uh, so Paul is awesome, and I want to commend him on his efforts in founding Trash Club and doing this for our community. I guess the question I want to know is, with the success of this, what resources do you need from Boise to expand this to a state program and then possibly a federal program? Well, first off, thank you, KP, and I really um, admire the work you've done at the Garden, too, which I know you're going to be talking about here in a second. Um, so, I mean, right now, in the immediate future, uh, Trash Club is, you know, really entirely funded by myself. <laughs> um, I, I pay out of pocket for mostly everything, which as a college student is not super easy. Um, so, like, money is the number one thing. Money for grabbers, because they break a lot. Money for supplies, money for um, just general expansion. Um, and that, that, that's mainly just for the Treasure Valley. Expanding past the Treasure Valley, I've thought, it about, I've thought about it a little bit, and I think that you could potentially do something with, uh, in terms of working with other universities to kind of um, seed different trash clubs. But um, at least right now, I feel like my, like, I care about Boise, right, and I have a lot of pride in, in our community here, and my, my heart's more in keeping this, like, kind of a local thing, and hopefully serve as a resource for other movements, like, if somebody wants to do something similar in, let's say, like, Salt Lake City, right, they can come to us and say, you know, hey, how did you guys do it, and we can give them the, the resources for that, um, but, you know, at least how I view Trash Club right now, it's something that's, you know, special special to Boise, right? It's a, it's a special thing here. Um, 
but you know if other organizations want to use us as a resource like definitely we'll be that resource um but in terms of expanding just here in boise it does ultimately boil down to money um i hate to say it you know i hate being like that guy that you know asks for money um or does like you know the you know does like a, a pitch but you know at the end of the day we're an organization we we have expenses that are barely being met right and we can only do so much with the current amount of funding we have thank you so much paul um i think one thing that you've said before that has really hit home for me is that the goal of Trash Club is to not be needed anymore, um, which I think is something that people don't think about, and I don't know if you want to expand on that. Well, yeah, I mean, we hope that through Trash Club's mission, right, we can set that precedent I talked about where litter's just not welcome here, and it's something that is become becomes culturally accepted here that litter's not okay. And if that becomes culturally accepted, the idea is that everybody will do their own individual part in keeping our community litter free. And, you know, once again, go back to all those little individual efforts will ultimately make a big difference, right? Your, your individual effort as, as one person is seen by other people, right? And it snowballs and it snowballs and it snowballs. And ultimately you have this, this avalanche of momentum um, for good, right? Um, and that, that's kind of the hope. And, you know, I don't know, like, what kind of, like, data or factors <laughs> will have to be met for Trash Club to not exist anymore. But, um, you know, I hope that eventually just, you know, people in Boise not only say, like, oh, litter is bad. But, you know, if they see litter on the street, they pick it up, right? If so one of their friends is throwing something out their car window, tell them, like, hey, yeah, that, that's not cool, bro. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Paul. Okay, we have one more student speaker tonight um, to wrap us up, and this is Callie Prophet, who is a senior at Boise State and who is part of the Community Garden Club. She will present about the wildlife on this planet and the balance needed between wildlife and humanity on the planet. Hello everybody, thank you so much for having me. Um, I realized this morning, and I edited it on Google, but I need to make sure before I even start this to recognize the Native American and indigenous people of this area and of North America. We will not really understand our landscape and landscape management until we recognize our Native American indigenous people because they've managed our land for thousands of years which is why we have the landscape of North America today. I also personally want to commend the Choctaw Nation because my family and County, Ira and County Mayo and County Cork, thank you for your contribution in 1847. So with that, everybody, moving on, this is who I am. I've been in school for a very long time. I could classify myself as a hillbilly since technically we live in hills, which is where our name comes from. So at this moment, I am in a lab performing necropsies on many raptors and different birds of this area and throughout the Northwest, trying to understand the possible lead poisoning within our ecosystems. All right. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Carbon is life. Chemistry is life. Carbon easily bonds to other atoms. Carbon creates more functions and shapes and biomolecules, such as our RNA and DNA. Carbon maintains biological life's replication and growth rates. Wildlife on this planet maintains Earth's replication and growth rate. This occurs through wildlife's daily, seasonal, and annual biological functions. Through their chemical exchanges, through their mating, through their migration patterns. When a matriarch elephant teaches her family to travel across those lands, she is moving trees and rocks and shaping the landscape. When the salmon return to Idaho, they are bringing phosphorus and other nutrients back 
to the landscape. Their daily lives have created this planet that we share with them. Seed dispersal, because we all eat food. And most importantly, pollination. Where would we be without our pollinators? We are facing that now. And then how do I play this video? So this is a TED Ed video, and it's just an open-minded idea to the possibility of where life started on this planet. spread volcanic activity and an atmosphere that created hostile conditions. So where on Earth could life begin? To begin the search for the cradle of life, it's important to first understand the basic necessities for any life form. Elements and compounds essential to life include hydrogen, methane, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, phosphates, and ammonia. In order for these ingredients to co-mingle and react with each other, they need a liquid solvent, water. And in order to grow and reproduce, all life needs a source of energy. Life forms are divided into two camps, autotrophs, like plants, that generate their own energy, and heterotrophs, like animals, that consume other organisms for energy. The first life form wouldn't have had other organisms to consume, of course, so it must have been an autotroph, generating energy either from the sun or from chemical gradients. So what locations meet these criteria? Places on land or close to the surface of the ocean have the advantage of access to sunlight. But at the time when life began, the UV radiation on Earth's surface was likely too harsh for life to survive there. One setting offers protection from this radiation and an alternative energy source. The hydrothermal vents that wind across the ocean floor, covered by kilometers of seawater and bathed in complete darkness. A hydrothermal vent is a fissure in the Earth's crust where seawater seeps into magma chambers and is ejected back out at high temperatures, along with a rich slurry of minerals and simple chemical compounds. Energy is particularly concentrated at the steep chemical gradients of hydrothermal vents. There's another line of evidence that points to hydrothermal vents, the last universal common ancestor of life, or LUCA for short. LUCA wasn't the first life form, but it's as far back as we can trace. Even so, we don't actually know what LUCA looks like. There's no LUCA fossil, no modern-day LUCA still around. Instead, scientists identified genes that are commonly found in species across all three domains of life that exist today. Since these genes are shared across species and domains, must have been inherited from a common ancestor. These shared genes tell us that LUCA lived in a hot, oxygen-free place and harvested energy from a chemical gradient, like the ones at hydrothermal vents. There are two kinds of hydrothermal vent, black smokers and white smokers. Black smokers release acidic, carbon dioxide-rich water heated to hundreds of degrees Celsius and packed with sulfur, iron, copper, and other metals essential to life. But scientists now believe that black smokers were too hot for LUCA. So now the top candidates for the cradle of life are white smokers. Among the white smokers, a field of hydrothermal vents on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge called Lost City has become the most favored 
third candidate for the cradle of life. The seawater expelled here is highly alkaline and lacks carbon dioxide, but is rich in methane and offers more hospitable temperatures. Adjacent black smokers may have contributed the carbon dioxide necessary for life to evolve at Lost Sea, giving it all the components to support the first organisms that radiated into the incredible diversity of life on Earth today. Did you know that a single-celled organism caused the first mass extinction? Check out this animation about how it all... So the Ozark hellbender and the eastern hellbender are types of salamanders, which are amphibians. So I want to ask if anybody knows, why do amphibians matter ecologically? Can we take a guess? That's okay. They're indicator species, and they breathe through their skin, most of the species. If our amphibians are indicating that our water quality is going downhill, should we be paying attention to that? I think so. I would like to focus mostly on these two and the fact too of why does it matter that we care about these wildlife or that we save them in general? What answers would we get as humans? Evolutionary science. We can't beat it. It's out there. It's there for us to study, to help, to understand. We could learn so many things from them. The Eastern Hellbender is larger, lighter colored, and the Ozark Hellbender is smaller and has different spotting. The Ozarks of Missouri and some of Northern Arkansas is the only place in the world that you'll find these species of the Ozark Hellbender. What secrets could they have for us? And more importantly, what secrets could they tell us about where they're headed? I have talked to many old anglers and hunters from the area, and just 50 years ago, they covered the river floors for gagging season when getting frogs. Now we're lucky to find 30 of them in a year. They live in fresh water and spring water, and if there is pollutants, they will not be able to survive. Along with that, I had a couple other experiences, being able to work with CWD and northern white-tailed deer, uh, rails, whiptail lizards. Each of these was a very special moment in which I was educated, trained, and had legal documentation to work with these animals. This is just to show you, again, the types of variety found here even in Idaho and how well is expanding. So I worked with wildlife and then I got to work with humanity. It turns out kids are the best people to work with when it comes out to the environment. I have had a bunch of different opportunities of working with adults and kids, but most importantly, it was here at Boise State with campus universe, with uh, sustainability, campus sustainability. They have been a jumping off point for me after all these years. I am actually able to do something and it's nice. All right, so I wanna leave you with the reflection as Paul already touched on. What are daily actions an individual can do to reduce their carbon footprint? I brought my reusable water bottle today. It's one of my favorites. How can we sustainably address and apply environmental economics in this anthropomorphic age. And then fail or succeed in our endeavors, what effects will this have on wildlife and subsequently humanity? 
education and outreach is the solution. Thank you, everybody. So do we have any questions for KP? Hi, KP. Um, I actually worked with the Foothills Learning Center um, this past six months or so before I had this position. So I wanted to uh, just have you talk more about what you did with Bugs because um, we partnered with them a lot and I thought it was a really great experience. I wanted to focus, thank you. I wanted to focus on the video because it's amazing and it's just so much information, just a piece to try to understand where we came from. In regards to the Foothills Learning Center and Boise Urban Garden School, they're some of the best programs that are available today. Foothills Learning Center focuses on the sagebrush restoration, the different wildlife here, and then what I did is I worked with Boise Urban Garden School and focusing on creating sustainable habits and urban gardening. And so, let's see, in this one picture, yeah. So, is this the pointer? Yes. Um, my camp kids were always great. I was actually an educator in the middle of COVID. So, started teaching in 2019 and then went into 2020. So, camp was a very interesting um, adaption. She's on her safety spot because we wanted the kids to be able to interact and feel like they could be in a camp, but also feel safe. We also had B camp, which is one of the most intensive camps I've been to. It was amazing. Learned everything because you take the bees for two weeks, you're taking care of them. Um, Ari, what exactly do you want me to expand on in terms of Boise Urban Garden School? Yeah. And that's actually my really big hope for the Community Garden Club. We have so many wonderful people who are so interested and want to help out. And an urban garden in this ever-expanding Boise city right now in 2022, that's a big deal. And it's a big deal to have a landscape for us to experiment and take care of. My hope is that my lessons and the different outreach that I've learned with these programs can be applied and Boise State can become like Boise Gert or Urban Garden School, an educational facility. Do we have any other questions? Um, I was actually able to work with KP, I think last year, um, when she was a part of Campus Sustainability. And to see what the Community Garden Club, so it used to be the Sustainability Club, but then we had too many things that had the word sustainability in it and it got very confusing. Um, so we changed it to Community Garden Club. And um, if you don't know where it is, it's on Juanita Street, right off campus, 1415 South Juanita Street. You should go stop by. Um, what KP had done, you know, we, all the club officers had left, and so this space was open, and um, it really needed some work done. Um, and KP devoted so much time to that. And I just want to really congratulate her on, you know, having the club restart and having it be a more sustainable process and you know not just her working on it as a full-time student and having a job and man managing a full garden that was a lot um, but now we have a great group of students that are helping that happen so oh and Jen has a question I would just echo that uh, KP did such a great job with the garden we had our whole soils class come and visit last year um, and that was in between you're working with the, in the Earth, Wind, and Fire Lab and doing organic <laughs> carbon testing. So thank, thank you for all you did. And I just wanted to say all the speakers today were fantastic. Um, and the organizers are just phenomenal. So, and we even had folks come from all the way from Oregon. So thank you for, for coming. So. Yeah, I would like to thank everybody for this. Um, we just started last year and already we're here and it's grown so much. Uh, I do want to give one shout out to Dr. Jen Pierce. I have lived in four different states. This is my third university. I've worked for a lot of professors and grad students at this point. This woman knows what she's talking about. Please listen to her. Okay, thank you so, oh. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, KP. Awesome. Um, so as we wrap up this event, we just want to say thank you for being involved with this event. Um, and if you went to the event last night, thank you for attending that as well. Um, if you were not able to make it, that one will be available to just stream it. Um, and we can send out the recording. I also want to encourage you to head over. Um, so the Center for Visual Arts, Arts, which is that super cool, scaly looking building um, over there is having their Spark Change exhibit opening. Um, and so this is gonna be on the second floor in room 207 and it's from two to four, so right after this. And the, disp the display will be open for the next two weeks and all of the art must um, have a theme related to environmental sustainability, whether that is with the um, objects they use to make the art or just the idea of the art. Um, so that's something to check out. I think the campus sustainability team will head over if you want someone to head over there with. Um, there's also a really cool luminary exhibit, which is a digital museum um, that is touch activated glass and they use projectors and surround sound and it creates this really immersive art exhibit and that is also um, now it's open to celebrate Earth Day and I think it has something to do with rainforest and meditation um, so I'm really excited to check that out um, but with campus sustainability we just want to say thank you all for being here um, thank you to my awesome team for showing up and helping it always makes um, uh, these things a lot easier and if you want to get involved we have internships and job openings as well coming up um, so just visit Boise State slash sustainability and thank you so much Thank you.